Kingdom Soul, book two of the Kingdom Cold series. Written by Brittany Chanel and performed by Lessa Lamb and Matthew H. Longoria. One, Minso. Every night when I close my eyes, it's the same. Rushing water, my body pushed against Charlotte's, my hand tightly pressed against her mouth, and the clanging of metal that ended my brother's life. I've been drowning ever since, my screams smothered by the waves, my movements slowed, and my tired arms unable to break the surface before another wave crashes down, tossing me through the abyss. Year after year slips by, but the memory returns like an echo. Again and again, I wonder if Charlotte hears it too, wherever she is. I awoke to what felt like the gentle kiss of fingertips on my cheek, only to discover the white petals of the cherry blossom tree had floated through my open window. The morning's golden rays granted me a moment of peace before my mind acquainted with the world the way it was. A world without my little brother. I dressed quickly, unwilling to break the silence and hoped to sneak out before my attendants arrived. The sunlight seeped through the hungy walls, meaning it might already be too late to leave unnoticed but all I could hear outside was the rustle of the cherry blossom tree. I slid the door open and stepped onto the clay platform below. My heart leapt as I eyed the kneeling servant, Minji. Don't bother, I barked. Minji bowed and closed the door to my bedroom as I turned toward the palace. Sir, she said, her voice breaking. She shrunk beneath my gaze. His majesty wishes to see you in the throne room. I could have kicked her, and the thought lingered in my mind for several moments before I dismissed it and turned away. I needed to get out of here before she further burdened my morning. I eyed the castle walls, wondering how big of a deal my father would make if I ignored his request and went into town. But the throne room wasn't far from the front entrance, and I was in no mood to battle. I walked past a series of buildings, each made from wooden pillars and clay-tiled roofs with elaborate, brightly colored woodworking designs framing each pillar. The clouds hung in the sky like spun sugar, pink from the sunrise still caught in them. Beyond the palace walls, mountains reached above like walls of a fortress. The most striking element of Vyres this season was the cherry blossoms now in full bloom. Still, the wind carried a bite of frosty air that tossed the white petals like snowflakes in a storm. I shivered as I passed the rooms of my mother and older brother, Sumin, and stopped when I reached Young's. His attendant waited outside his bedroom like he'd wake up and ask for breakfast. My father was a senseless man. Almost five years later, and he can't even reassign the staff. I stepped to the edge of the palace lake, my father's throne room platformed at the center of it. The lake, sprinkled with white petals, thrashed with a sudden gust of wind. The petals caught the morning light like stars twinkling in the night, like there was something left on earth to celebrate. I crossed the stony gray bridge and kept my head down until I knelt at my father's feet. Rise, Minso. I stood up to find my father perched on his throne in his red handbox with golden designs that weaved up his sleeves and a slender black hat atop his head. I bit back a smile. He looks like a great stuffed bird on a nest. There is a strategy session this evening. It's time you attend, he said, his gentle voice whispering around the room. I can't. I have plans to meet Junho at the- That wasn't a request. I wrenched my hands, suddenly aware of the cold glares from around the throne room pricking my skin. Hanbit, the king's advisor, and a slew of guards I used to train with, bristled. 
I bowed. Forgive me, Father. I only meant my presence at these meetings in the past haven't... It's time. I clenched my jaw and bowed before turning away and making my exit, swallowing the truths I couldn't speak. He still had attendance outside of my dead brother's room and somehow believed I was the one who needed to move on? I exhaled my frustration through gritted teeth and reminded myself it wasn't his fault Young died. It was mine. On my way out, I caught a flash of Jae Hyun, a soldier I'd once been close with. If he wasn't working or if I wasn't inappropriately headed to drink first thing in the morning, I might have considered inviting him. He bowed to me as I left the throne room and stepped back out onto the stone bridge. A few hours later, I slammed down my empty ceramic cup. More, I bellowed, my head bobbing back and forth at the table. Jun Ho lay his chopsticks on his bowl of rice before reaching for the bottle of rice wine we call makoli. Shouldn't you sober up a bit before the big meeting? He asked. More, I commanded. Jun Ho sighed and picked up the bottle, pouring the white liquid while his opposite hand lay politely on his chest. You know, man, maybe he's right. Maybe it is time. I slammed my hand on the table, rattling the dishes and sending one of my chopsticks flipping through the air and onto the floor. The clatter cut the babble of the other customers and drew their eyes to us. I raised my hand to wave away their attention and the room soon buzzed once more. Junho's face reddened, but it might have been that way from the Makali. You and I both know those meetings are pointless. What is the intent of having a great army if you can't use it to avenge your son's death? I groused. The man is a coward. I reached for my chopsticks, but one was still on the floor. Junho nodded his eyes flickering toward another table. That may be true, he said, pouring himself a shot. But how are you going to change that if you never attend the meetings? Your Highness, a mousy voice whispered. A woman who appeared to be in her late fifties held out a new pair of chopsticks. Thank you, I said, trying to dismiss her with my tone. I turned back to Junho, who held out his shot glass. Come, babe, I said, clashing my glass into his. Just as I was about to throw back another shot, I noticed Junho's eyes flash back toward the table to our left. I lowered my drink. What are you looking at? I asked. Oh, he said. I think I know that guy. The corners of his mouth turned up. Don't look. I turned. Don't look, he whispered sternly. He concealed his face in his hands. The other table had three Viren men sharing a pot of Mayantong, a red fish soup, and drinking makoli. Judging by the quality of their clothing, they were upper-class citizens, and the three empty makoli bottles on their table indicated they'd likely been there as long as we had. Two of the men chatted loudly but the youngest man on the far side of the table who seemed to be in his early twenties quietly and conspicuously stared down at a small plate of kimchi. Stop looking, Junho said, drawing my attention back. Junho dug into the fish with his chopsticks, pulling out the meat of the jaw muscle, my favorite, and stuffing it into his mouth. Look, he said, it won't be as bad as when you first returned home. It was all so fresh. Nobody blames you for losing it as you did. You're killing my buzz. Junho's face drifted to my left once more, and I snapped my head to look. The three men rose from the table, scrambling for their wallets. The young man smiled shyly at Junho before his gaze met mine, and he quickly turned away and hurried out of the restaurant. I shook my head and turned back to Junho. Does that guy owe you money or something? Junho shook his head. Should we get you some water? Nah, I said, picking through fish bones to get some meat. It doesn't matter how many meetings I go to. My father will never attack Camelot.
What about Charlotte? I halted. He must have been drunker than I thought to mention that name. My mouth dried. What about her? I spat. She could still be out there. Charlotte was certainly dead, and I didn't appreciate Junho's mention of her. For almost five years, I've tried to overcome losing her. At first, I tried convincing my father to allow me to seek revenge. When he refused, I tried the company of other women. But there was no antidote to be found in my bed. No, antidotes came in bottles. Drunk, celibate, and numb, I drunk nearly every day to drown out those memories. And I endured headaches and nausea all so that names like hers never drifted in. The room spun, but with one mention of her name, I was transported to five years ago, when my wounds were still bleeding, and her tearful eyes turned from me that final time. Anxiety pooled beneath my skin as I felt her name reverberate around the room. Surrounded, my only option was to escape the restaurant and get some air. I stood, dropping silver coins onto the table in front of Junho. Don't be a fool. Two, Charlotte. I watched intently as four-year-old Morgana threw a handful of dead orange flowers in the air. And then the witch blasted the king with another fireball. Her soft round face was bright with excitement. She shouted as she leapt to the other side of the room, picking up a strategically placed stick. No, she called back in a deep voice as she waved the stick in the air. Her power is too great. Now I must die. She dropped to the floor only to bounce up and race to the other side of the room. Next, I'll go rescue the... Gabriel clapped his hands loudly, interrupting. Morgana opened her mouth to continue, but I joined in with Gabriel, clapping and cheering. Morgana's wrinkled forehead smoothed as she forgot all about the second part of her show and beamed with pride, her smile bright even with a missing front tooth. I bit down on my bottom lip to refrain from laughing. This was the tenth play Morgana had put on today. What an exciting story, my love, I said, scooping her into my arms. Bravo, Gabrielle said, tickling Morgana, who squirmed out of my grasp. Time for bed, he said, chasing after her. I watched them play. Morgana looked too much like her father to be mistaken for anything other than Viren. The only bit of myself that I saw in her was the wild mop of curls on her head and the face she made when she was pouting. Even her skin looked more like Young's than mine. I was sure people suspected Gabriel was not her biological father. Gabriel's skin was a warm chestnut brown, a bit like my father's, but his had red undertones. Mine was a lacy brown with a distinctive yellow that shone brightest in the sun. Both were several shades darker than Morgana. Biological or not, I could hardly remember a time before our family of three. The past was filled with days I didn't relish to reminisce on. And these last four years had changed me from a broken girl to a strong woman. Gabriel entered the room, his bulky frame strong and muscular. He kept his hair short, but the waves of his natural curl were still visible. He had a thick black beard that framed his kind eyes beneath the wide ebony eyebrows above. But his most striking feature was his curly eyelashes that flitted with every smile. I often found myself wondering how a man so intimidating in both size and features could also be so beautiful. She's promised to go to sleep now, he said with a chuckle. Did you triple check that all the candles are sure, he said, putting a hand gently on my shoulder. It's been two years, 
I don't think there will be another incident. His gaze was warm, his charcoal-colored eyes gentle, like the breeze on a hot summer day, and his eyelashes like the rays of the sunrise in a world with a blackened sun. He pulled me in, and I buried my face in his chest, letting myself relax. Some families are made, and others found. From the day we met, Gabriel felt like he belonged with us. Cosmic restitution for a lifetime of sorrow. Even as strangers, we forged a haven for Morgana with the shattered pieces of our former selves. But one shadow from my past lingered, threatening all we'd built, and I couldn't hide from it in Gabriel's embrace. My calm shattered as a flash of orange light shot through my memory and sent a cold shudder down my spine. Regardless, I said, pulling away. I'd better see if there's any news. For the last couple years, worrying had become routine. I grabbed my cloak and headed for the door. Ask Lynn if she's got any leftover scones, Gabriel said. Will do, I called over my shoulder. I closed the door behind me and took a deep breath. The cool air still tangled with the last bit of winter. As I moved toward the center of town, I looked back at my peaceful cottage tucked away on the outskirts. We were safe. He wouldn't find us here. I scurried by the other cottages as I went. I heard the chatter of the townspeople and saw the glow of the torch-lit streets ahead but it wasn't until the dirt paths became cobblestones that I considered myself in town. I heard the clop of horses on the hard stones and hustled toward the tavern on the west side of the square. Blue de Lune. The tavern sat alongside a busy street and was always packed with locals, mostly due to the friendly barkeep, Lynn, who had an affinity for baking that brought people together like nothing else. Still several blocks away, I could taste the sweet, doughy scent wafting through the air. My mouth watered. Lynn's cooking drew a bizarre mix of locals to the tavern, but that made it a good place to gather information. If he was still looking for me, Lynn might have heard something. I pushed open the doors of the tavern, and the rush of sugary air hit my face. I was not surprised to find the tavern filled with boisterous people, goblets of ale on each table with plates of half-eaten scones and cookies. There was hardly an empty seat except for the few vacant stools at the bar. Lynn rushed about refilling the goblets, her fluffy hair pulled into two puffs on her head. She looked up from the keg and smiled at me, motioning to an open stool at the bar. A crash on my left sent my hand instinctively to the dragon-hilted dagger I kept hitched to my belt. A handsome brown-haired man with silver strands in his beard bent down to retrieve his spilled goblet. His gaze met mine, and a twisted smile grew at the corners of his mouth. I rolled my eyes and took my seat at the bar next to an old man who seemed somewhere between asleep and awake. Lynn rushed over. Charlotte, she said, her voice muffled in the noisy tavern. She reached over the bar and hugged me with her free arm, two full goblets of ale in her opposite hand. I'll be right back, she said, rushing out from around the bar and toward the tables in the back. Charlotte, eh? I turned to see the old man grin with a toothless smile. I like that name. It reminds me of the former queen of B Sir, I jabbed. Mind your words carefully. I scanned the tavern. The man threw his head back and laughed, his white hair only present just above his ears. I'm too old to be shipped off to one of the king's camps. I'm above the law. He can still kill you. He took a gulp from his goblet. Just this morning, I met a baby with the same name. He looked up at me a glimmer of mischief in his eyes. 
Guess you can kill a kingdom in body, but not in soul. Yep, he was going to get us both killed. I lowered my voice. Excuse me, sir, have we met before? In another life, perhaps. He stood and thumped three copper coins onto the bar before grabbing his jacket and heading for the door. Lynn rushed over, her hair buns bobbing with each step. Sorry about that. So, what's new? Lynn's bronze skin accentuated her beautifully curved nose. Who is that man? I've never seen him in here before. She traced my gaze to the old man who'd just pulled the tavern door open and headed out into the night. He said his name was Morris. He's friendly, don't you think? I nodded. It wasn't a familiar name, but it certainly seemed like he knew who I was. I tried shaking the encounter from my mind. I hated thinking about Besmium. It made me think about all I'd lost. Who I'd lost. Still, whenever I thought of Young, I felt a stab of sadness that never dulled. Most days I could carry it, but on the days I couldn't, I was grateful to have Gabe be there for Morgana. The word besmium wasn't illegal, but Camelot's King Arthur loved taking prisoners, and neither he nor his soldiers needed much of a reason to take anyone in. Because of this, I hadn't needed to face the mention of it often, just when one of the drunk patrons at the tavern got bold and reminisced. There was usually a guard or two around to end it quickly. However, I couldn't escape the dreams. Dreams don't care about death or distance. Some mornings I'd wake up with Young's kiss still on my lips and have to relive his loss when my mind turned to the morning once more. Each night that he returned, I'd fall for the illusion. And each morning, he slipped away again. You having some ale tonight? Lynn asked already filling a goblet and placing it in front of me. Before I could answer, the bubbles of crisp ale tickled my throat. Had a girl, she said, and I felt the color return to my cheeks. Have you heard anything? I asked before swallowing another mouthful of ale. She shook her head. Not about them. All anyone could talk about is Camelot's new alliances. They're saying Algony agreed. My eyes bulged. That's impossible. Algony would never agree to that. It must be a rumor. Lynn shrugged. As for them, no news is good news. If they'd been spotted near town, someone would have said. Three. Minso. I stumbled through the double doors of the council hall. Alarmed to see my father already seated at the head of the table beside my older brother, Suman. Why hadn't I expected to see him here? Mr. Perfect, here to witness another breakdown. Ever since I'd caused a scene at the meeting after my return five years ago, Suman kept his distance. It was like grief was a virus you could catch, and I was its host. When we crossed paths, he just stared down at me with the same stern look in his eyes as our father, a look that whispered, You're the reason Young is dead. The room echoed with the sound of my footsteps and hummed the whispered disapproval of the council members. I took my seat on my father's left side, the Macaulay from earlier turning in my stomach. Even with the liquid courage, I was unable to meet the king's gaze. After several painful moments, my father cleared his throat. You may begin. A white-haired official who wore a silky orange sash over his handbook bowed and turned to address the table. The first order of business is to discuss the matter of succession. Prince Suman and his wife have yet to produce an heir. I couldn't see Suman from his position on the other side of father but I felt a twinge of joy to learn he wasn't as perfect as he pretended to be. The official continued. 
It's time to start considering other options. My father waved his hand. He's still quite young, he said. Send the doctor to visit the couple and find out if there's a reason for the delay. What's next? It was faint, but I heard Suman whisper thank you to the king. The official with the orange sash bowed and continued. As you know, Camelot is a growing concern. They've acquired many of the adjacent territories as allies, including their newest conquest, Algony. The room erupted into panicked chatter, but one voice rose above the rest. A young, red-faced council member shouted, There's no way that Algony would ever enter into such an arrangement. Not after their disgraced son Emmett had a hand in the creation of Camelot. A thin, sunken-cheeked official interrupted. What are the benefits of joining these alliances? It must be very tempting for so many territories to have conceded. The room fell silent and all turned to Hanbith, who wore a blue sash indicating his position as the king's advisor. He blanched at the sudden attention and flipped frantically through his notes. Hanbit was well-known and intelligent, but lacked the nerve for public speaking. According to our spies, Camelot offers nothing but the opportunity to trade with them and in return gains favorable trade rates and control over the Allied Kingdom's military. The red-faced man spoke. Are they fearful of losing their throne if they don't agree, like Besmium? I felt the gaze of several of the council members on my face. They must have feared I'd react to the mention of it. But I was only there because I had to be, and I planned to keep my head down until the meeting ended. Still, the words stirred up something iniquitous inside me, something I'd been avoiding for the past four years. My father's soft voice spoke. It appears that we don't have all the information on this matter, and with the acquisition of Algony's military, it would be unwise to attack Camelot. We should focus on building up our forces in case they offer us an alliance and countermeasures need to be taken. We must never agree to enter into such an unfavorable situation. He straightened his posture. And you, he said, motioning to Hanbit. Increase the number of spies in Camelot and increase the regularity of their reports. Instinctively, I scoffed, garnering an uncomfortable amount of attention from the attendees. My father leaned in. Care to share your thoughts, Minso? A dull headache began to throb behind my eyes. Don't say anything, Minso. Just shut up and get through the meeting. I felt the words forming on my tongue and bit down to stop them from coming out. Damn it. I think now is the perfect time to attack. If Camelot is acquiring allies, they're only going to get stronger. Just look at how much they've grown in the last five years alone. The man with the orange sash spoke, a flash of defiance in his eyes as he addressed the room. Attacking on their land will give them the upper hand. Due to our location, it would be difficult to transport troops and supplies. I held his gaze and was surprised when he didn't waver beneath it. My absence from the meetings had negatively affected my credibility, but it wasn't going to stop me. Difficult doesn't mean impossible. We need to show them that they can't just take anything they want, that they can't get away with what they've done, I said, slamming my fist on the table. The smack of the table silenced the room, and I moved my gaze from one member of the council to the next. My father leaned in, the sternness of his face absent from his voice. Revenge will only lead to more death. I straightened my posture, feeling disapproval ready to spring from the lips of every council member in the room. All the more reason to attack. My father sighed, his irritation marked by a hard line across his forehead. Enough, Minso. He turned to the other council members. Is that all that's on the agenda for today? He asked. A frazzled Hanbit pulled on his blue sash and shook his head wearily. 
There is one more thing. His gaze moved to me. But perhaps now isn't the best time to speak of such matters. My father waved his hand dismissively without so much as a glance in my direction. He's fine, he's fine. Go ahead. But I wasn't. I was fuming, unable to live with the fact that my brother was taken from me by a teenager who earned a throne in some ridiculous contest. A lump in Hanbit's throat rose and fell before he spoke. Apparently, there are rumors that the former queen of Besmium, Charlotte, still lives, and that the king's men, barring one incident, have had difficulty locating her. My body pulsed. She's alive? The room buzzed with questions, but they blended together like a dizzying smoke. The thought rang in my head again and again. She's alive? The red-faced man shouted. Does that mean the child lives as well? That could solve our succession problem. Another voice interjected. We could send a small party to try and retrieve them. She's alive. Out of the question, the bold man said. The girl made her choice long ago. Any interference on our part could be seen as a declaration of war with Camelot. She's alive, and I abandoned her. Four, Charlotte. I knelt beside the magnolia tree, the buds already pink but not yet open. I traced my fingers across the ridges of Young's name. I'd chosen a tree near my home to carve his name, a place I could visit him and sometimes talk. This was the place where I gave myself time to turn grief into memory. When we'd moved to flee capture by Lancelot and his companion Merlin, I'd had to choose a new tree, but it wasn't like Young was buried there. I shuddered to think that his body still lay in the atrium where he fell, beneath the ruins of what was once Kader Castle. But there were many thoughts I dared not dwell upon. Papa, Morgana said, hugging the tree. She sat down beside it and prattled a nonsensical story with no foreseeable end. I smiled, feeling the warmth inside push back the cold of the afternoon. I lay back against the tree and closed my eyes. Morgana's voice faded until the only voice left to hear was my own. I walked through an empty, gray world that seemed to be made up of the absence of everything. I held out my hand and pushed through the dull, colorless particles and watched them swirl around my fingers. Lucid, I looked out into the vacant space. Young, I said, and there, through the gray mist, I saw his silhouette. Relieved, I sprinted forward through the clouds toward him. The mist swirled around my ankles and brushed against my cheeks. Breathlessly, I pushed through, the shadow of him never growing closer. My legs weakened, but I didn't slow. I wouldn't, not when he was so close. Young, I screamed. A hard gust of wind pushed through, slicing the mist. An empty gray space with no discernible horizon line lay before me. Charlotte, Young called, his voice muffled. I stopped, unsure if the wind was knocked out of me from my run or from his voice. Behind me? I turned back, and in the distance, I saw a figure running towards me. Charlotte, he called. I tore toward the figure, unable to breathe or blink for fear I'd miss him. I ran, my hands outstretched as his face came fully into view. First his dark eyes, his high cheekbones cutting through the remaining strength in my legs. His round lips a dash of pink in this gray world. Even as he yelled my name, his eyes had the calm, 
soulful glint in them that others get when staring out into the ocean. A few yards away, I could see tears on his cheeks as he reached for me. A gust of wind shot between us, pushing us further apart. I covered my face with my arms and felt myself slide back on the smooth gray surface. My eyes stung. Young, I called, my voice muffled and lost to the wind. No, I screamed, unable to open my eyes in the monstrous gusts. I love you, I love you, I love you, I shouted. The wind cut, and I stood alone in grayness once more. No, I whispered. I love you. But he was gone. I stood, shaking. There you are, he said from behind me. Before I could turn, his hands were on my waist. He spun me and pulled me tightly to him, his hot mouth on mine. He buried his face in my neck, his tongue sliding up it and sending a chill through my body. I held him so hard, it hurt. He pulled me off my feet and I wrapped my legs around him. He lay me on the ground and pressed his body to mine. His lips parted from mine as he whispered, I love you too. I ran my thumb across his cheek and stared into his eyes as the mist around us turned from gray to gold. My heart thundered against my chest, and I was certain he could feel it because I could feel his. His hand moved from my body to my hair. Hot tears stung my eyes as I erupted into sobs. He kissed my jaw and laughed, wiping my eyes, warmth radiated from his body. I awoke beneath the shade of the tree, my eyes dry. The golden glow of the sun hovered as it threatened to set. Morgana was still midway through an endless story. He was gone, and once again, the pain of his loss was as fresh as the first time. I clutched my stomach to keep from screaming. The agony was as much a part of me as my pulse. I exhaled the worst of it, the memory of my dream evaporating into the orange glow. I could almost feel his kiss on my lips. Instead of crying as I used to, I smiled. I thought a thank you to him for visiting and stood, rubbing my cold arms. Say goodbye to your father, Morgana, I said. Morgana stood and took my hand. Bye, Papa, she said. I'll tell you the rest later. She tossed her hair over her shoulder, and we headed back to town just in time to see the sunset. Five. Minso. My heartbeat drowned out the sound of my father calling my name as I leapt from my seat and ran towards the door. I had to find her. I burst into the cool night air. Lanterns flickered along the bridge, illuminating the white petals that sprang off the nearby blossom trees and settled on the surface of the lake like freshly fallen snow. Get my horse, I called to our stable keeper. Breathless, my vision blurred. Get it together. I'd need to prepare for the journey. Supplies. I'd probably need to convince Hanbit to come so I could use his leads about her whereabouts. I'd need Junho and a small team of soldiers, maybe even Jaehyun. It would take days, several days to prepare at least, but I reeled. I needed to move, to think, to be out in the fresh air. I looked up to the silvery half moon. I was jolted from my trance by the clip-clop of my horse's hooves on the rough path. My stable hand breathed heavily as he bowed and handed me the reins. I mounted my horse and felt a flicker of something warm inside. Something I thought was gone. Thank you, I said. 
The stable hand recoiled and stepped back. You're welcome, your highness. I rode towards the front gate, suddenly conscious of how I'd treated everyone for the past few years. It was a miracle I still had a friend left. Without even realizing it, I headed toward his home. The cold of the winter was over, and the blooms of spring brought new life. I rode through the gates, through the dirt roads. Clay-tiled homes nestled behind their walls, the streets alive with people rushing about, enjoying the fine weather, even in the lantern-lit night. Charlotte, I whispered into the empty air. Then I saw her, soft brown skin, dark secret-filled eyes, spiral curls. My cheeks burned, and she was just a girl then. Now she was a woman of 21 at least. I felt fire kindle in my chest. In the four years since Besmium fell, I hadn't requested the presence of any woman to my chambers. I hadn't courted, and my mother knew better than to attempt another arrangement. I spent my time convincing myself Charlotte had died that winter, until I believed it, and then I forced myself to forget. I was nothing but the shell of Prince Minso of Ayers, until moments ago when Charlotte re-entered my world, sparking my light. Now the blood coursed through my veins once more. Vyers was home, and when I had returned broken and lost, I vowed never to leave its borders again. How quickly I turned on that vow as I raced through the night. I pulled on the reins, slowing my horse as my mind crawled towards the somber truth. I'd made other vows. I vowed to my brother I'd protect Charlotte, and vowed to Charlotte I wouldn't leave her alone. I'd broken those as well. I stopped my horse. My mind flashed to Charlotte's cold expression shrinking into the distance as I rode back to Vyers without her. She hadn't shed a single tear that day. It was entirely possible that she'd never forgive me. I dismounted, unable to take a step forward. My horse stirred, sensing my uneasiness. I exhaled all the hope I'd allowed myself to build in the last few moments. I ran my hand through my hair and felt my eyes prickle. She'd never forgive me. I swallowed a mouthful of shame, the acidic taste still lingering on my tongue, and tilted my head back. I stared vacantly at the moon and sighed. My gaze drifted down to the ground below like blossoms on a windless morning. A gust of wind pushed at my back. Then a thought hit me so hard, it pulled the breath from my lungs. What about the baby? If Charlotte was alive, the child might be out there too. Young's baby. I stepped forward. My mind spun with the thought. A part of my brother was still in this world. I pulled myself back onto my horse and, before I knew it, I was riding full force toward Junho's house. I looked up at the cherry blossom trees, the ones I'd missed this year. There were so many buds that hadn't yet opened. Six, Charlotte. I pushed open the tavern door and stopped, my hand immediately moving to my dagger. It wasn't that the tavern was packed with dozens of soldiers in blue or that there was barely enough room to stand. It wasn't the roaring laughter or the general chaos. What unsettled me was the smell. Lynn hadn't baked today. In all the time I'd known her, she'd never missed a day of baking. I couldn't see her from the door. Just an army of soldiers at play. I knew I should leave. I knew that. Not only was I a woman in a tavern with 60 drunken men, but if Lancelot and Merlin were among them, I shuddered. Still, Lynn was in there. I knew she could take care of herself. She was a tough person. But she hadn't baked, and that worried me. I put up the hood of my shawl and made my way to the bar. I saw an opening and moved my body into it, only to be shoved out by a large man with thick black hair on his arms. 
Wait your turn, he barked, shoving me back from the bar without even glancing in my direction. I pushed back into my place, prompting the man to turn to me with such force he nearly knocked over the soldier on the far side of him. His face was lined with a snarl until he saw me. Oh, I'm sorry, milady, he said, and sheepishly retreated into the crowded room, ale in hand. Pleased, I scanned the bar for Lynn. She darted in from the kitchen, slinging ale across the table so quickly the other bartends stood back so as not to get in the way. Of course, she's fine. I breathed. She probably didn't have time to bake, that's all. Relieved, I turned back to the exit. It didn't seem like I'd have much time to check in today, but I could always return tomorrow. For now, getting as far away from anyone who could recognize me was the top priority. Hey, I know you, said a man from behind me. My stomach tightened. I turned to see he was slightly familiar, a regular at the tavern. Handsome, with a sandy brown beard that was sprinkled with gray. He swayed before he stood and slunk towards me. His voice carried, drawing the attention of several soldiers. I heard a rumor. He swayed forward, the ale on his breath stinging my nose. I heard that husband of yours likes the company of other men. I turned back towards the door and started pushing my way to it. His wide arm wrapped around my waist and pulled me to his body. He lowered his mouth to my ear and slurred. Let me show you what a real man can do. I sighed. If I attacked him, I'd draw too much attention, and if I drew blood, I could be arrested and dragged to one of Arthur's camps. I twisted his wrist and felt his knees buckle from the pain. I leaned in close to his ear. If you ever touch me again, I'll kill you. I released his wrist and saw him rub it as I pushed the door open and headed back into the night. I walked home slower than usual and had to admit to myself that I was shaken. Not by the drunk idiot, of course but by the rumor. It was happening again. Just when we'd finally settled in. After Besmium fell, I'd taken odd jobs and relied on the charity of some citizens who were still loyal to my father to get through the first winter. Morgana and I moved a lot in those days, so as not to burden any one person too much. That's when the notices went out that Arthur was taking prisoners and putting bounties on members of the council or any dethroned royalty. There wasn't anyone I could trust. And the people who'd been helping me could be punished if it was ever discovered. I decided to take Morgana and head for a new town farther away from where Himes or Kader once stood. Minutes after we arrived, I saw Gabriel bloodied and on the ground as a group of thugs beat him. Their words as they struck him reflected that of tonight's rumor. Fairy, Pris, they'd said. Instinctively, I'd stepped in, without a plan, and with an infant in my arms. What could I do? I could no longer use my name and former title to aid him. They'd probably drag me in for the bounty if I did. Instead, I introduced myself as Gabriel's wife. And after some convincing, they let him go. To this day, I've wondered what exactly it was that thrust me into action. But if I had to guess, I'd say it was this light he had inside. This joy that couldn't be extinguished. Even as they'd wounded him, he'd smiled. It's the kind of light that people who live in darkness seek to destroy. And though I'd sought to protect him, he became the haven who rescued me. 
As we grew more familiar and decided on an arrangement where we would live the lie that brought us together, I was never able to ask him if any of it was true. It didn't matter. From that day forward, he'd been a teammate and a father figure to Morgana. I'd always assumed he might talk to me about it when he was ready, but he was eager to hide his past. And so was I. I realized through our unspoken understanding that we had already given up on a happy life. But together, we could make a peaceful one. I thought it would go on like that forever. But after a year, the rumors about Gabriel started up again. We'd discussed it and decided to move to another town for our safety. We'd packed up as much as we could and planned on leaving in the morning. That night, two seemingly unrelated tragedies had occurred. Morgana's bedroom had caught fire, and we'd come face to face with the man tasked with my capture. Lancelot of Camelot. Seven. Lancelot. My nose prickled with the overwhelming scent of lavender. The unearthly fog swirled around me in a purple cyclone. I listened intently for footsteps, relying on the one sense she hadn't hindered. A shadow moved through the fog, but I knew better than to attack the first time she showed herself. She'd gotten me with that one the week before. Impatient, I gripped the hilt of my sword. Merlin, I called into the darkness. When am I going to be in a situation where I'm surrounded by violet mist? I spun in time to block her kick from connecting with my face. I stumbled back, tripping over a stump that sprouted from nowhere, sending me crashing to the ground. The newly forming tree snaked its vines tightly around my wrists and locked me in place. The mist dispelled and Merlin stood over me, sword pointed at my throat. Her rich umber skin was beaded with sweat, her bold lips continually drawing my eyes against my will. And this is why Arthur won't knight you. I seized, ripping the vines out of the ground and tearing them from my wrist. We can't all be the king's favorite. Besides, it was your stupid vision that got me assigned to this quest in the first place. If not for you, I would have made night years ago. She lowered her sword, pushing her mint green braids over her shoulders to her back. If you hadn't let Charlotte get away two years ago, you'd be a knight. I stood, rubbing my sore wrists. You say that like you weren't the reason she got away. She rolled her eyes. I told you there was a baby close by. I don't care, kill it. I pushed past her, ignoring the disgusted glare she shot at me. I marched towards the forest edge and headed for the inn. So I guess we're done training for the day? I heard her call. I huffed. How dare that insolent witch insult a future knight of Camelot? I rummaged through my trunk, pulled out a piece of parchment, and headed to my desk where my ink was kept. Knighthood wasn't any closer than it had been years ago, and I was growing restless. I needed them to respect me, all of them. I took a deep breath, sighed out my frustration, and pulled the image of my beloved into my mind. Dear Gwen, not a day goes by that I don't miss your bright smile. I promised you that I'd complete this quest and be knighted, but neither of us could have predicted it would take so many moons to complete. But worry not, my love for you is as true as the day I bid you farewell when you cried in my arms. Once I'm knighted, I'll have the means and title to marry you at last, and we can finally be together. And I promise on that day, I'll never leave you again. I've not received any of your letters as of late, but with Merlin and my location changing so frequently, it's not surprising they've not found their way to me yet. 
Even without them, I can feel your love. Also, please keep an eye on Arthur, will you? Make sure he doesn't get himself in any real trouble. Apart from you, he's the closest thing I have to family. And please congratulate him on his new alliance with Algony. With love, Lancelot. I sat back, resting the quill in the ink pool. I read the note over. A knock on my door startled me. Come in, I yelled, my voice cracking. I quickly folded the letter. Merlin walked in, her dark brown skin still shining with sweat. Her green braids were loose and danced over her body, bucking off her lower back as she took a seat on my bed. Look, I'm sorry about earlier. I shouldn't have said that. I was just trying to motivate you. I turned towards the window. She walked over, putting her hand on mine. She lowered her voice. Of course Arthur will knight you. Don't worry, we're going to capture her. I'm here to help, she said. I met her gaze, her facial features softening, her eyes beaming with the light of a woman in love. I knew because that's how Gwen looked at me. I pulled my hand away and her gaze moved to the letter. She turned away. Oh, is that for Gwen? She faked a smile. Bet she misses you. Her smile was bright, but the light in her eyes was gone. Merlin was the only known magic wielder in Camelot, and Arthur was obsessed with finding more for his army. Because of this, Arthur allotted her more freedoms than most, and I wondered how Charlotte still managed to evade. I grew ever more suspicious that Merlin was somehow hindering progress for her own purposes, and she'd noticed the tension. Even so, I had to admit Merlin was beautiful, enough to draw the attention of everyone she passed and garner us a bit of a reputation. Soldiers in Arthur's army were many and nameless, kingdomless even, but everyone knew Arthur's knights, and it was nice to hear my name among them, even if it was only mentioned as Merlin's partner. I'd been tied to her for so long. I remember how envious I'd once been of her abilities, it took almost two years to realize just how much of a burden they placed on her, and how much in the way of family and companions she'd lost as a result. But even if my heart didn't belong to someone, I couldn't surrender it to Merlin. That's what it would be, a surrender. I couldn't bear the thought of a life where I followed her lead and trailed behind her. My growing indifference about her powers had brought us together, our differing genders pushed us apart because, even with Merlin's beauty and talent, there would never be any other woman for me but Guinevere, and Merlin knew that. Still, every once in a while, I saw hope in her eyes, and most of the time I didn't stop it. I needed her to help me find and capture Charlotte, and nothing was going to get in my way. 8. Minso The carriage jostled as it moved along the stone-speckled path. The horses jerked the cabin with each step, and my lower back cramped from sitting for so long. I didn't care, though. I was glad to be off the dreaded sea. I hadn't recalled this journey taking so long when I traveled to Besmium with Young. I eyed Junho warily as he slept as soundly as a man in his own bed. I don't think Young ever slept soundly after my father told him he would marry Charlotte. Beside Junho sat Hanbit, quill and leather-bound book of parchment clasped between his slender fingers. While I was certain his intel would help us locate Charlotte, his character made me doubt if having him along was worth the torment. He had this odd habit of whistling when he was uncomfortable, as if a tune would drown out the ramblings in his head. We'd asked him to stop dozens of times, but every time he'd lose focus, he'd begin again. The man couldn't help it. After the first few days, we learned to tune it out, but every now and then my mind would tune into the high-pitched melody and disrupt my peace. Once given my father's permission, Jae Hyun had also agreed to accompany us on our journey. 
but he marched along the other soldiers outside the cabin. My guilt lay just beneath my skin as I recalled my father's expression when he asked me not to go to Camelot. I'd hurt him. In his eyes, I could see he was certain that I too would be killed on the unholy land that now belonged to Arthur, but I had no choice. The moment I found out Charlotte was alive, I'd made up my mind to go. No one, not even the King of Vyres, could stop me. When my father was certain he couldn't persuade me to stay, he made me promise I'd bring Charlotte and her child back to Vyres where we could protect them. I tried to imagine a Vyres with Charlotte in it, but couldn't. Apart from Junho, Hanbit, and Jae Hyun, my father sent ten Viren soldiers to accompany us on this quest. It was enough to make sure we were well protected without seeming like an act of war against Camelot. With a multitude of lengthy travel days under our feet, we were a little irritable and in need of rest. The carriage bumped up onto a smoother surface, a more level road. I knew we must have been close to a big town. Finally. I pulled back the curtain and a white beam of light poured in, waking Junho. He scowled unpleasantly. I peered outside, pleased by the stone-built structures and angular rooftops, which were a stark contrast to Vyre's. Even the people who roamed about seemed to be of every complexion and creed, no doubt an advantage of Arthur's takeovers. The last time I was in Besmium, I spent my time in the king's castles or as a prisoner of Arthur's dreth and army in the woods. This was the first time I'd spent any real time in a city outside of Vyres. We approached a wooden sign that read, Welcome to Galvan. I'd never heard of it. It wasn't one of Camelot's famous cities like Bullhorn or Rowandale. But from the small window from which I observed, it was huge. The architecture was simplistic. In Vyres, we considered the designs and spent many years constructing palaces and temples that would last. Structures our kingdom could be proud of, that travelers came to admire. There was nothing of that scale in Galvan. But the sheer quantity of structures built in such close proximity gave the city a spirit that tempted me to leap from the carriage and explore. The farther in we went, the tighter the streets between the buildings were, and I wondered what might happen if we came to an impasse with another carriage. Our carriage stopped. Excuse me, madam, I heard Jae Hyun say. You're blocking our path. It was all the reason I needed. I'm not missing this, I said, pushing the door open and stepping out into the stale sunlight. Forgive me, a woman replied. Are you from Vyas? I hurried past the horses to see her. There, in the center of the road, was the most unearthly figure I'd ever laid eyes on. She was tall, almost my height, with toned muscles and a powerful stance. Her cool black skin shone in the sun like she admitted light, and long sea foam green braids flowed from the top of her head and past her waist. Each tiny movement sent a wave of green locks dancing around her, like the ocean's constant clash against the shore. She wore armor, but based on the scarcity of it, I'd say it was for style and not protection, a trend that had reached Vyers as well. She had many rings on her fingers beneath each joint, and more around her wrists and arms. As I drank her in, my gaze settled on her lovely top-heavy lips. My first instinct was to kneel. Who is she? A goddess, perhaps? Jae Hyun hadn't answered her, and I assumed he was struck with similar thoughts. I stepped forward, mustering my voice to sound strong. Yes. I am Prince Minso of Vyres. Her gaze shifted to me, making me feel small and weak. Her eyes lit up. A prince of Vyres, she said, stepping forward. My guards drew their swords. She stopped eyeing them suspiciously. And what business do you have in Camelot, Minso of Vyres? Merely traveling to admire the great kingdom of Camelot. She put a hand on her hips, weakening my nerve. 
There are a lot of guards here for a mere vacation. Yes, I said, trying to blink out her obvious beauty. I lost my brother to this land. She tilted her head, observing me, her dark eyes moving down my body and back up to my face. May we pass? I pushed. She didn't move. My presence bothered her in some way. Would we have to fight her? Merlin, a man called. I squinted into the light to see a heavily armored man approaching. Even with the armor, I could see he had powerful shoulders. As he neared, I saw the hazel green eyes that were as clear as the evening. His square jaw made him look older from far away, but when he stood next to the goddess, I could see a touch of childhood still holding his features. He might have been striking, though not conspicuously handsome, if not for the woman beside him. At most, he was in his late teens, and it seemed they were traveling alone, which eased me a little. If this came to a fight, we could easily overcome them with our numbers. What is this? The boy asked, his gaze bouncing between Merlin and me. I'm not sure, she said. My most recent vision was undetermined. He sighed. Let's go. He turned and started walking in the direction from which he came. Merlin smiled, but a sparkle in her eyes alerted me to danger. She held out her hand, prompting my guards to raise their swords. She laughed mischievously. It's a gift for the prince, a little piece of home. She opened her hand to reveal a small pink cherry blossom. I froze. Did she want me to take it? I inched forward but felt someone take a hard grip of my arm. I turned to see Junho. He shook his head. Merlin smirked and dropped the cherry blossom. It floated beautifully from her hand to the earth below. In an instant, the small blossom melted into a pink liquid, soaking into the ground. We watched it in awe as Merlin turned and followed her companion. One root at a time, in a matter of seconds, a cherry blossom tree sprouted from the ground. It thickened, quickly prompting the horses to inch back nervously. Bigger and bigger, the giant trunk stretched, each branch weaving into the air and sprouting thousands of pink blossoms. Impossible. Yet there it was, happening before my eyes. There was no such thing as magic. Is this some kind of trick? Or did we just encounter a witch? Perhaps my original assessment of goddess was more accurate than I thought. I'd just witnessed the divine. I stood beside Junho, frozen in silence as we tried to process what occurred. There, in front of us, stood a cherry blossom tree that rivaled the beauty of those environs, though moments before it was just a bud in Merlin's hand. Even without trying to process the enormity of what she'd just done and what it meant for our world, I was looking at a new issue. She'd blocked the main road, and it might take several hours to cut it down and clear the mess away. We had the option, of course, to backtrack and go another way. But since she'd gone through the trouble to delay us, I wanted more than anything to continue. Nine. Merlin. What was that about? Lancelot spat. I sighed. You couldn't tell who they were. He gulped his ale. Virons? His sandy brown hair was unkempt, his pale skin heavy with exhaustion. This quest was wearing him down. His strong jaw clenched as he anticipated my answer. I ran my finger along the rim of my ale, picturing the face of the stunned prince. That was Prince Minso of Vyers. Lancelot slammed his goblet on the table. You think he's after Charlotte? My eyes drifted to his near-permanent frown. I pulled a quill and paper from my bag. Obviously. We should have killed him on the spot, 
Why did you- His voice faded away. I reached into my mind's eye and let a memory that wasn't mine flow through my body and concentrate on the hand that held my quill. My hand moved, but I could no longer see the paper, the quill, or the tavern. And Lancelot may have been a thousand miles away for how scantily I could feel or hear him. When my hand once again belonged to me, I blinked the bar back into existence, handing the note to Lancelot. Dear Charlotte, I've fallen in love with you. You're the reason I can't return to Vyers. Love, Minso. Lancelot looked up from the note. Wasn't she married to the other brother? I shook my head. The point is, he loves her. If they've arrived here after all these years, they could have information about where to find her. Lance nodded. And we can follow them. Exactly, I said, brushing my braids over my shoulder. So, what was with the tree? I smiled, fiddling with my rings. A message for the King of Vyres. I put my head down on my arms. That was a big tree. Perhaps I shouldn't have overdone it and conserved a little more energy. I eyed Lancelot, but he didn't notice. He drank his ale and chipped mindlessly at the wood on the bar. He was a powerful swordsman, maybe the most skilled Camelot had to offer. But he paid no mind to battle strategy or planning. Arthur was right to deny him a knighthood. Not to mention his mind was poisoned with love from that snake, Guinevere. I never understood what the big deal about her was anyway. Beautiful? Yes, but empty-headed as a ceramic vase. Above all, I hated the way Lance looked when she didn't write. When I first volunteered to accompany Lance on his knighthood quest, Arthur refused to let me go. He needed the world's only battle mage by his side. He considered me his greatest asset, and it was an honor to serve him. But I couldn't pull my thoughts away from Lance. He wasn't especially kind to me, just the opposite. He didn't mind me at all. He gave no special attention or courtesy. He never gawked at my unusual appearance or inquired into the extent of my power. Some might have even considered him unkind, but I loved the way he made me feel ordinary. Surely, if I traveled with him, he'd see I was more valuable than Guinevere. I'd meditated on a solution every spare moment. Out of my desperation to join him, a blurred vision had pushed through. A drop of magic in Charlotte's royal blood. The promise of two battle mages at his side convinced Arthur, and I'd been beside Lance ever since. Even so, Guinevere still held his heart. If I captured Charlotte, I'd be the one who helped him reach his dream. When he returned to simple Gwen, he'd see her for what she was, and he would see me as his champion. I often wondered what it would feel like to be loved that way, the way he loved Gwen. He pined for her, lived his life for her. I think that's why I'd taken to him. I believed that if he was capable of that kind of love, perhaps one day... If I remained by his side, he'd look at me that way. It was ridiculous, of course, and the more I watched him fawn after Gwen after all these years, the more my hope waned. I felt my eyelids get heavy from the ale, so I sat up, just in time to see Min So barge into the tavern with his strong postured friend and a weasel of a man who held a quill to paper like he needed to document each move the prince made. I sighed. Of all the taverns, he chose this one. Maybe my vision had more credence than I'd originally given it. The prince's gaze brushed over us, and he hesitated to enter, eventually taking a seat near the back of the tavern. Several guards joined him a few minutes later, but since it was only half of them, I assumed they were still clearing away the tree. 
It felt unusual not to interact after we'd made such a fuss earlier, as if we were off duty. That was just fine with me. I was too drained to put on another show. Several hours passed and the tavern filled. Every so often, the prince's friend would come to the bar and order another round of drinks, using a guard's help to deliver the sloshing goblets to their table. Despite the fact that we'd started drinking earlier, Lance seemed to try to keep pace with the prince, his words starting to slur. His head bobbed as he recounted Gwen's beauty in an endless drone. I tuned out. What a bizarre four years it had been since we set out on Lance's knighthood quest. One blurred vision started it all, more of an inkling that the former queen of Besmium, Charlotte, was still alive and possessed magic blood. But Arthur had taken every vision and request seriously since he saw me cast my first spell. I relished every moment Lance and I spent together and I had Arthur's quest to thank for it. As I watched the foreign prince drink with his comrades, I wondered what it might be like to belong to such a happy grouping. My family had cast me out for the unique abilities Arthur welcomed, and since then, my abilities were the only things people knew about me. Except for Lance. He was the only one I felt knew me beyond just my power. He knew my weakness. He was my weakness. But even he had a way of reminding me how lonely life actually was. I think, of all things, the loneliness was the biggest surprise life had yielded. Merlin, was it? A voice piped from behind me. I turned to see the prince, red-faced and grinning like an idiot. Intriguing. So... Are you a witch or something, he said. A Viren accent present that wasn't earlier. I winced. I prefer the term mage, I said, stretching my shoulders back. Is your hair really that color, or did you do that with magic? That's a rude question. Are you a stick person, or do you detest manual labor and exercise? To my surprise, Minso of Vyas threw his head back and laughed. I've been going through something. An honest answer. Just when I thought I had him figured out. Delighted, I leaned forward. So tell me what you're really doing in Camelot. He took a seat beside me, his confidence much more prince-like than before. He almost looked charming. What else can you do with your power, he said, his eyes lingering on my shoulders. He's... Unbelievable. I contemplated if I should strike him or allow him to entertain me for a while longer when Lance stepped between us. Why don't you go back over to your table? She's not interested. My heart leapt as Lance puffed up his chest. Was that jealousy? I put my hand on Lance's shoulder. That's okay, Lance. He's not bothering me. I lied. Lance turned to me slowly, a thousand questions reflected in his hazel eyes. See, Minso said, patting Lance on the opposite shoulder. We are fine here. Shit. In one fluid act, Lance's fist connected with Minso's cheek, splitting it along his cheekbone. I turned, and the swords of five Viren guards pointed at our throats. I channeled my remaining energy into the bottom of my lungs and pushed the guards across the room with a gust of wind. I pulled Lance to the door and shoved him out before turning back to the stunned guards. I'm terribly sorry, your highness. My friend has obviously hit his limit. I will take him home immediately. The wide-eyed prince brought his hand to his bleeding cheek. That wind thing was impressive. Are you coming back after, he asked. Unbelievable. I left the tavern, pulling Lance along with me. At least I didn't have to worry about retaliation. In fact, 
It seemed Prince Minso of Vyas could be the key to getting everything I'd ever wanted. Both Charlotte and Lance. Ten. Minso. We stayed at the tavern until the tree was cleared. The room worried with the excitement of witnessing Merlin's power firsthand. Junho, Hanbitten, and Jae Hyun acting out the scene and arguing over its details. It was a sealed room, and she'd conjured a wind powerful enough to push most of the ale off the tables, even in the back of the tavern. Instead of being angry about their spilled drinks, the guests gushed about their experience. Even strangers outside of our company joined us to swap stories about the king's favorite new weapon. She had garnered a reputation for being unpredictable, and her unique appearance highlighted by her green braids made her easy to identify. It was as if the force from the gust came directly from her soul. Was all of Camelot this interesting, or did I have a habit of finding trouble? I leaned back in my chair, entertained. They were the kind of stories anyone might have dismissed as fantasy, but it was undeniable now. I wasn't sure what to do with this new information. I wondered what my brother would have said if he'd seen the magic up close. He'd no doubt be searching for a logical explanation. And her companion, a red-bearded man said, his dark eyes gleaming with delight. Lancelot, he's on a knighthood quest. I shook my hair out of my eyes. What's that? That's how we do things here in Camelot. Certain soldiers are given the opportunity to win a title and become a noble family after completing a trial set by our king. I laughed. Win a title? He scratched his beard. It's how Arthur plans on spreading out the new wealth. It ain't natural for a kingdom to grow so quickly if you ask me, and on the backs of prisoners no less. So what's this guy's quest? I asked. Not sure, but I'll tell you what. Knighthood quests are supposed to be completed alone. The fact that he's got a witch helping him means it's probably something crazy like slaying a dragon or something. I smiled with delight. Hey, don't joke about dragons. Earlier today, I was sure magic was just a myth. The bar shook, and for a split second, my mind stuck to the word dragon. But a heavy-set bar patron pulled himself off the floor, brushing the ale off his shirt. He waved off our attention, and the tavern returned to normal. Dragons. What a thought. Hanbit's whistling started up again, a clear sign he had checked out of the conversation. I turned to him, hoping to distract him long enough to spare myself the sound. Any news? I received word yesterday that Camelot means to ally with Quembley. Really? That far north? I supposed they had some decent mountains up there, some mining camps, but that was as far north as Vyres was east. Surely Arthur wasn't planning on stretching his reach that far. How long until he went after Vyres? I needed to find Charlotte and get out of here. Is the tree cleared? I asked Jae Hyun. Almost, your highness he said, as he and two other guards dragged in three huge velvet sacks. What's in there? Jae Hyun reached in, pulling out a handful of pale pink blossoms. Part of the tree, he said, his eyes holding a touch of green in the tavern light. Why are we keeping the tree? Sir, it's only part of the tree, you know, he scratched the back of his head. Since it was made with magic, we figured we should take it back to Vyres to see if there was some kind of trick to it. I nodded, and the soldiers carried the bags out to the carriage. We should get moving, I said. Jae Hyun nodded, and I was surprised by his eagerness, because I'd remembered him to be a man who frequented bars and Vyres. He sat down beside me and leaned forward, his cheeks red from ale. Your Highness, shouldn't we rest for the night? I shook my head feeling the world lag behind, weighed down by my alcohol consumption. When did I get this drunk? I suppose from all that posturing with Lancelot. 
If they'd meant to follow us, now is our best chance to put some distance between us and them. I sighed. I'm tired too, but it looks like that Lance guy will be out for the night. I've never fought a magic wielder before, and I'm not sure if, even with our superior numbers, we'd be able to take them down. Merlin is too much of a wild card. We can't risk it. After a momentary pause and an exasperated groan, the soldiers one by one prepared for the long night ahead, some putting down their nearly full ales in one shot. We had no leads to go on, and we hadn't even given the city a look yet. But something about being in proximity of Merlin and Lancelot unsettled me. She'd reminded me that anything imaginable was possible, starting with the most ridiculous. So I made a snap decision. Our next city would be decided by fate. Hanbit whistled mindlessly from the corner as we came up with our travel plan. Jun Ho and Jae Hyun held up a hand-drawn map of Camelot against the tavern wall. The cities listed were just the ones the bar patrons could think of off the top of their heads. The place where one man met his wife, another man's favorite city for fishing. They were so sloppily placed on the map it resembled more of a list than anything else. I unsheathed my dagger and aimed at it. He's too good at this. Make him close his eyes or something, Jae Hyun said. Hello, Jun Ho interceded. You realize he's throwing that dagger at us? Jae Hyun's eyes bulged. Aim true, your majesty. With one throw of the dagger, we loaded up the carriage and rode through the night. And I wondered if it was the last I'd ever see of the strange enchantress. I didn't know why, but I hoped it was. 11. Charlotte She's finally in bed, I said, scanning the room for Gabriel, but the room was empty. A knock banged from the door, and I opened it to find Lynn, hair puffs and all, a basket of baked goods slung across her arm. Before I could greet her, Morgana's tiny footsteps came blasting toward us. Lynn, she said, jumping into Lynn's arms, nearly knocking the basket over. Lynn spun Morgana. There's my little princess. I clenched my jaw. Any other nickname, Lynn. So what are you doing here? No tavern tonight? She nuzzled Morgana. I took the day off and Gabe called in a favor. I must have looked puzzled because she added, for your anniversary. She stepped aside and there stood Gabriel in his finest clothes, holding a fistful of yellow wildflowers. His dark features and sunny smile warmed me. Wow, Gabe, this is so... Unnecessary. Sweet. I turned back to Lynn. Are you sure this is okay? You never take time off. She tickled Morgana, who squealed and squirmed from her arms. I'm overdue. Besides, it's been too long since I last spent time with my little pr- I mean, monster. Thank you so much, Lynn, I said, kissing her cheek. Anytime. Now go, so Morgana and I can have a tea party, she said. Morgana's face lit, and within moments, she was pushing me toward the door, her curly hair bouncing with equal enthusiasm. As Gabriel and I strode along the cobblestone streets of the city, it was as if we'd just met all over again. We chatted as we always did, avoiding any heavy conversation. Nothing important. Except, I felt it coming. When we'd first come to this arrangement, I feared Gabriel would ask too many questions about my past. But he didn't, and I knew it was because he had his own secrets to protect. But now I could feel the questions coming. I could feel his intentions pressing down on our small talk. We stopped into a restaurant, a nice one, and I worried that my dirt-hemmed dress wouldn't be suitable for somewhere so nice. But we didn't eat there. In fact, Gabriel merely spoke to a servant and was handed a large basket that the server made look heavy. Gabriel took the basket out of the restaurant, and we headed out of the city. On the outskirts, we came across a small pond. 
Normally, it would have been too small to be striking or even noticed. But tonight, it seemed infinite as it reflected the star-speckled sky and orange crescent moon. We took a seat beside it, and Gabriel pulled a small candle from the basket and lit it before he broke the hush. Part of the reason I wanted to do this tonight was to talk to you about our arrangement. Please understand that this is all coming from a place of love. We never talked about what this plan would mean long term. My eyes moved to the flickering candle, unsure if it would stay lit in those first few gusts of wind. I mean, he took my hand. What happens if you fall in love with someone? I laughed. Is that what you're worried about? Don't worry. Love is over for me. Forever? I nodded. I think that's a mistake, he said. I froze. Where was this coming from? Are you in love with someone? I asked. He put his hands up defensively. No, no, but if I ever get the chance to be, I'm going to take it. And I want you to do the same. You're free to go, of course, whenever you want. But I can't love. Not anymore. He nodded solemnly. I think you're too young to just give up on it altogether. I mean, I know your husband died in the war, but maybe if you told me the whole story, I could understand. I looked up at him. I had spent the last four years trying to close that book, and here he was asking for me to open it. My mind raced with recollections I hadn't dared revisit. My parents, my unusual childhood, my friend Millie, a kingdom at war, an arranged marriage, two princes, poisoned wine, Emmett, and young, my lost love. My stomach clenched. No, I can't. He reached out and touched my face. I'll go first. There was this man, Raj. My eyes widened. As I'd suspected, the rumor was true. After four years, he was taking this leap? I found myself drawn in, finally uncovering the mystery of my angelic partner. If he'd hidden it, I knew this story wouldn't have a happy ending. Could it be that, without words, we'd borne something in common all this time? Something we'd been helping each other overcome? He continued. He was beautiful, radiant like the sun itself. He smiled, his eyes glazed over with the memory. He taught me how to be a great merchant, but he really taught me how to connect with people. It was only a matter of time before the rumors started. When two souls are that connected, it's obvious to the world. What happened? I asked, entranced. He looked down at his hands. One night, he didn't return home. I waited for a few hours, and when he didn't show, I set out to search for him. Not an hour later, I found him half alive. Gabriel's eyes teared up, a single tear breaking onto his lap near our hands. He died a couple of days later from his injuries. He laughed, startling me. Do you want to know what he said to me in his last moments? I nodded, unsure if I really did want to know. Worth it. Gabriel beamed at me, love still alive in his eyes. Water droplets clung to his thick eyelashes. His energy flickered out, and he continued. 
After that, I went looking for a fight, and I found one. I was ready to follow him, to die like he died. If he was executed for our love, then I too would die by his side. That is, until a teenage girl intervened. I reached out, wiping the tears from his face. I buried my face in his chest. He wrapped his arms around me, the warmth reaching all the way to my bones. I was glad I'd stepped in that day. Glad to have Gabe in my life. He always felt like the only person in the world who understood me. And now I knew why. He wept for several minutes, and I bit back my urge to cry. Finally, he pulled back and spoke to the top of my head. So, please, just tell me one thing. His name, he said. We can sort this out together. His story rattled me. The look in his eyes. It was how my eyes had once looked. Gabriel and I had had something important in common all these years. Something that silently held us together. Something I'd only guessed at until now. His name, Shar, he pushed. I swallowed and let his name slip from my lips like my soul from my body in death. Young, I whispered. His arms slowly loosened around me, but I didn't move. That's a Viren name. I felt my breath leave my lungs. Which means he was King Young of Vyres. My breathing toiled in my chest, heaving as the words lashed me. Which means you're not Charlotte of Camelot. He lowered his voice. You're Queen Charlotte of Pesmium. After several minutes, he laughed and tightened his grip on me. Actually, if I think about it, it makes perfect sense. Why, I asked, his laugh easing me. Because you can't cook at all. We laughed together, the final wall between us falling away like one of Lynn's crumbled scones. We were husband and wife, or as close as we'd ever be. It was all I wanted. Like I'd told him, love was over. I was happy to have a home, happy to belong somewhere. I was certain I'd live the rest of my life in this safe, comfortable world we'd built together. Until a week later, when, like Raj, he didn't return home from work. 12. Lancelot I awoke with the scratch of dry air like knives on my bare throat. Water, I croaked. I blinked my eyes open, the sun piercing into my head like the lances the knights used at Arthur's tournaments. Merlin, water. My voice rattled my brain in my skull, and I closed my eyes to rest. The door swung open and I heard the shuffle of small footsteps near. Definitely not Merlin. Your lady said she's going out to train. Told me you'd be in this kind of mood. I heard the clang of tin. I squinted to find a small gray-haired innkeep with a cup of water. I reached for it and embraced the cool liquid as it eased my throat. More, please, I said. But the innkeep had already begun to pour another cupful. She's not my lady, I said. The innkeep's wrinkled eyes blinked with disinterest. That girl, Merlin, she's not my lady. I have someone at home. You should get some rest, she said. I'll come back in an hour to check on you. I slunk back into bed, 
feeling the spin of the earth heavily to my left. Even so, that water had done me some good. When I awoke again, I felt more alert. I sat up and there, reading in the corner, was Merlin. She didn't seem to notice I'd woken, or maybe she didn't care. What happened to the Viren Prince? She looked up from her book, her glittering eyes setting me at ease. Everything was back to normal. They're gone. They must have known we were going to follow them. They snuck off while you were passed out. I lurched forward. Do you know where they're going? She looked at her nails. Not a clue. That was our only chance to find Charlotte. How could you let him go? Here we go. I pulled myself out of bed and walked over to intimidate her. If I didn't know any better, I'd think you didn't want us to find her. That way you could keep me away from Gwen. She picked at her nails, and without looking up, the brightest smile crossed her face. Cold, I looked down at my naked body. She tried to stifle a laugh, but it came shooting out of her nose. I ran over to the bed and ripped a blanket from it, wrapping it around me. Merlin was nearly in tears from laughing. Why am I naked? I barked. She sighed, attempting to bite back her joy. You threw up on your clothes. She fell into another bout of laughter. I had them washed. She pointed to the closet door where my clothes hung neatly. I shook with a mixture of rage and embarrassment. Why didn't you put me in something else? She snorted. You wouldn't let me. I sat down on the bed and sighed. My embarrassment lifted my rage. So the prince is gone? Look, she said. Don't lose hope. Charlotte is an extremely popular name. That's why our leads always come up as dead ends. But how often are there Virens in Camelot, let alone a group of ten Viren guards and a prince? It'll be no time at all before we get word of their whereabouts. She was right. Still, it was my fault they got away in the first place. Had Prince Minso planned this? At least I'd cracked him across the cheek. Royalty or not, this was Camelot, and I'd soon be a knight. Aye, Merlin, I said, still unable to look at her. Did anything happen last night? I tightened the blanket nervously. What would I tell Gwen? She stood and headed for the door. Of course not. She tossed her braids over her shoulder. Except... My stomach tightened. You said something cruel. My brow furrowed. It was an unusual thing for her to say. I said cruel things to her all the time. What could I have possibly said that hurt her worse than usual? My curiosity overtook my fear of her answer. W what did I say? She sighed. You called me beautiful, she said as she left the room and closed the door behind her. I was an ass. Merlin always got the brunt of my frustration, yet every day she stayed beside me. Cruel, that's the word she used. She was beautiful. I was sure everyone who passed her thought so. But was it so cruel for me to say it? Her beauty was as factual as a name, not a word of flattery. Was it because I'd only said it when drunk? Wait! I leapt up and pulled the door open. Merlin! She stopped and looked over her shoulder at me. You are beautiful. She smiled, but her eyes were heavy with sadness. Then her gaze drifted down. Crap! I grasped at the fallen blanket, wrapping it better around my waist. She waved her hand and started down the stairs. What was I doing?
13. Minso. Ugh, I moaned. Wellwood isn't nearly as nice as the other city in both size and quality. I mean, did you see our inn? Don't they know I'm royalty? Hanbit rolled his eyes, his lips already pursed to start whistling again. I mean, is there even a tavern here? I said as we walked along a row of worn down businesses. We came to a square with slightly better upkeep, and a soft gust of wind filled my nose with a sweet scent that made my mouth water. A bakery. I followed the scent until I stood outside a business called Blue de Lune. When I entered, it looked more like a tavern than a bakery. A woman with two piles of curls on top of her head and a well-curved nose wiped the bar with a cloth. Is this a bakery? I asked, wandering in. She looked startled to see me, but I'd been getting that reaction since I arrived in Camelot. It's a tavern, she said. But I also sell baked goods. I turned to Junho. Let's get some sweets and go. But weren't you looking for a tavern? Junho asked, looking around the empty room. I'm not feeling the wholesome environment, I said as the barkeep set out several trays of baked goods. I picked up a bread puff and popped it into my mouth. Surprised by the sweet cream inside, I savored it prompting Junho and Hanbit to do the same. We'll take the tray, I said. The barkeep's eyes lit as she scrambled to find bags for the puffs. Junho fished in his purse for the coins. Excuse me, the barkeep said. Are you Viren? I nodded, eyeing the last of the puffs as she shoved them into a bag. She handed them to me. And what brings you here? Surely there are bigger cities for Turing, Bullhorn, perhaps. I'm looking for someone, a woman named Charlotte. The barkeep lowered her eyes and began counting Junho's coins. Suspicious, I pushed. Do you know someone by that name? Uh, yes, sir, she said. There are many women in this kingdom with that name. When she was certain she had the amount she needed, she handed a few smaller coins to Junho, then handed the bag of puffs to me. Hanbit leaned in. Perhaps I can carry that for you, sire? Not a chance, I said as we left the tavern. The spirits of my men and I improved as we passed around the puffs and walked. Had it looked this nice before, or were the delicious cream puffs coating my perception? We strolled along the suddenly charming streets of Wellwood, until a voice cried out in pain, pulling me from the puff-induced trance. I hurried around the corner, my soldiers close by. There was a crowd of men huddled in a circle. Another cry burst from the middle. You damn fairy! A man yelled and kicked a bloodied figure on the ground. Before I could react, Junho drew his sword and barreled into the crowd. Shit! I pushed through, my guards on my heels. Junho stood at the front of the crowd, between the man on the ground and the angry mob. What is this? An angry red-bearded man called. I reached the front. What's this man's crime? I called. Junho shook and shouted. Disperse, this man is under our protection. I heard the word Viren bouncing through the crowd, but they didn't appear to be backing down. What was Junho doing? It was out of character for him to intervene. So why now? Junho, I whispered. What are you doing? His gaze met mine, an intense fire in them I'd never witnessed. I didn't understand, but I knew he had his reasons. Friendship often didn't need a reason to act. You're surrounded, I called, motioning to my guards at the back of the crowd. If you leave now, nobody has to die. Slowly, the crowd tallied the number of guards and eventually dispersed, grumbling under their breath as they went. When they cleared out, Junho knelt and assessed the beaten man's injuries. What's going on, Junho? Let's take him back to the inn and keep guards outside, just in case someone in that mob follows us. Junho, I repeated. 
What's going on? His gaze met mine. This man needs our help. I'd never seen him with so much conviction, yet he hid his reasons. Was there something I'd missed? Sure, someone was in trouble, but it wasn't our fight. For a moment, as he frantically worked to save this stranger, he reminded me a bit of Young. Yeah, he probably would have charged in the same way. We struggled to get the man to the inn. He was muscular and tall, each of his limbs like a tree trunk. After some time, we were able to get him into our carriage, and with the help of Jae Hyun and two other men, we carried him into the inn. I called a doctor to treat his injuries, but it wasn't promising. The man was bleeding and bruised. The doctor predicted he wouldn't make it through the night. Hour after hour, Junho stayed by his side. A brutal, sleepless evening, where Junho acted as if his presence beside the man was the only thing holding him to this world. I began to worry about his health when he wouldn't eat. His face paled, his eyes tense. I lay awake, waiting for bad news that never came. In the morning, the injured man regained consciousness long enough to tell us his name, and for him to whisper the words, My wife before falling back to sleep. I'd expected such a promising sign to ease Junho a little, but he still refused to rest. I couldn't get him alone to talk, but I noticed his gaze had changed from concern to anger. A few hours later, a commotion outside set me on edge. Jae Hyun ran in, blood dripping from his bottom lip. Out of breath, he said, It's the wife. She's crazed. I stood to the side, biting back laughter. Who was this crazed woman that struck Jae Hyun? As she barreled into the room, my heart stopped. Charlotte. Her golden brown skin shone, her curly hair pinned up on her head, but still her curls swirled around her like black smoke, moving of their own volition. Her cheeks were red but I couldn't tell it was from running or crying. Her dress, a tattered, stitched together heap of cloth that may as well have been a silk spun ball gown by the way it hung on curves that had never been present when I knew her. My legs jellied. Charlotte's gaze was locked on the injured man, her eyes fierce. A glint of wetness shimmered on her lashes, her unreasonably tawny eyes ablaze with strength. My pulse restarted when I caught a glimpse of her pink and floridly curved lips. She heaved her face and arms onto the injured man's chest, waking him. He wrapped his arms around her, and she wept, her curls bouncing with each gasp of breath. 14. Charlotte As Gabriel's arms wrapped around me, I felt relief fill my lungs. He was alive. But that calm feeling quickly succumbed to rage. Who did this? It had been so long since I'd let my emotions get the better of me, but nothing had compared to the fear I felt when Gabriel hadn't returned home. He'd just told me the story of Raj, and I knew when he didn't return from work that something must have happened. I whispered a silent thank you to Young for keeping him alive. Charlotte, someone said from behind me. I glanced over my shoulder and froze. My body surged with numbness. Minso. I wiped my tears and stood to face him. Your Highness, I said, curtsying. Some habits were difficult to break. Are you responsible for his injuries? Charlotte, he said, stepping towards me. My hand moved to the hilt of my dagger. Arms wide, he walked up to me, reaching for me. In an instant, my dagger was at his throat. He froze. I had gone weak in the knees from his smoldering looks once upon a time. His prominent eyes were dark and mischievous 
They had long, sharp angles and a heavy lid that accentuated the darkness of them. They whispered secrets, ones not asked to know. But I'd been thrown by them before. I'd even thought he eclipsed his brother when we'd first met. Something inside me wavered, perhaps just from seeing a familiar face, but I quickly crushed it. I could still see the dashing prince in there, buried beneath his tousled hair and stubbled chin. His once muscular frame was worn and lanky from inaction, his posture slackened with defeat and heavy with grief. I gazed at him, noticing the dark circles around his eyes. I bet, like me, he hadn't had a good night's sleep since Young died. But none of that warranted sympathy. In fact, I could probably slit his throat right now and not lose a bit of sleep over it. A Viren guard I hadn't noticed put his sword to my back. But I didn't care. I glared at Minso. Did you have something to do with my husband's injuries? A drop of blood slipped from Minso's neck, but he didn't flinch. Still, pain echoed in his dark eyes. I felt myself weaken as I noticed traces of young in his features. The same nose, the same cheekbones, similar eyebrows. Minso saved him a voice said from behind me. Your husband, I mean. I turned to see a man standing beside Gabriel's bed. When I turned back to Minso, there was so much hurt and sadness in his eyes that a touch of satisfaction filled me long enough to lower my dagger and sheath it. Without another word, Minso turned and left. Guilt seared my skin, but in a few short seconds, it transformed into boiling wrath. How dare he? I stormed out of the room and followed Minso into the street. What did you think? I yelled at his back as he paced through the street. That I'd just welcome you back with open arms? Several bystanders stopped to listen. He turned. I thought you were dead. I caught up, stopping in front of him. Yeah, I get why you'd think that. I was alone, pregnant, never lived outside the castle, approaching winter, and you left me there to die. Minso sucked in his words. I gritted my teeth. You thought you'd just, what, walk back into my life and be welcomed like a hero? Maybe welcomed as an old friend? Friend? Are you serious? I laughed at the absurdity. There's only one thing I can think of that could make you a bigger ass than you already were, and that's coming back after all this time. After I'm already okay. He tossed a shaky hand through his hair. Charlotte, where was this friendship when I'd just lost my whole family? I don't need you anymore. I need you, he said, his voice so gentle it would have made my teenage heart flutter. But those days were long gone, dead and buried with the rest of my past. Ah, this again. If I recall, you wrote me a letter once, remember? Minso's gaze softened. I continued. You said you loved me. Tears glittered in his eyes, but none fell. My mouth dried as I stepped closer, lowering my voice so only he could hear it. You know nothing about what it means to love someone. All the softness in his eyes vanished. He stepped closer, his chest so close I could feel the warmth of it. Me? He scoffed. How long after my brother died did you replace him? Crack. He stumbled back, stunned. His hand rushed to his cheek. My palm stung. He nodded and looked around the crowded square, 
His eyes glazed over with sadness. Do, my voice cracked. Do what you're good at and return to Vyers. I turned away, feeling a heaviness in my chest that I hadn't felt in many years. It might have seemed heartless to some, but what heart did I owe to Minso of Vyers? What heart could anyone expect me to still have after all I'd lost? When I returned to the inn, I knew they'd heard. The guards avoided eye contact, and one of the men looked as if I'd struck him as well. Gabriel sat up. Sure, are you okay? I faked a laugh and a smile. <laughs> of course I am. Are you okay? I was so worried. After spending the next half hour overwhelmed and constantly checking the door for Minso's return, I decided to get some air. Gabriel had fallen asleep, and I wanted him to rest before we tried walking home. Not a moment after I stepped outside, I knew I was headed to see Lynn. I didn't know how upset my run-in with Minso had made me until I looked at her. Her eyes widened. Are you okay? She asked. The bar was empty except for a man sleeping in the corner and a bar hand who raced in and out of the kitchen preparing for the night rush. I threw myself into a bar seat and nestled my face in my hands. No, I said. Gabe was attacked. What? She dropped her washcloth. Why? Is he okay? He's recovering. I should be able to take him home tonight. I'm sorry, that's a lot. I nodded. Yeah, and he was saved by someone from my past. Like an ex-lover? I shook my head. No, definitely not. But I think he was here in Wellwood looking for me. Her eyebrow rose. Definitely not? I just, I put my hands on my hips and stretched my back. I'm so angry. How can he even show his face here, you know? Nope, there's clearly more to this story. I'll grab you an ale and a cookie and we'll unpack this. Thanks, Lynn. A thud on the door drew our attention, and I looked up to see Min So fumbling with the handle. I leapt over the bar and lay flat on the floor behind it. It's push, Lynn yelled. I could hear the long, inconsistent steps of a drunk man walking into the bar. Ale, he said. Lynn said, right away. She knelt next to me on the floor. Is that him? She mimed. He's hot. She mouthed, fanning herself with her hand. She pulled an ale mug off the shelf next to me, filled it with ale, and handed it to him. Tough day, she asked. I reached out my hand to hit her ankle. What was she doing? I eyed the kitchen. If I crawled quietly enough, I could probably make it without being spotted. The worst, he said. I got kicked out of the tavern across the square. I began my crawl, inching toward the door. Bennigan's? Lynn asked. I don't know, Minso slurred. And the only woman I've ever loved, I froze, is married to this other guy. He slurped his ale. She hates me. Tough break, sugar, Lynn said. Hate is a funny thing. At the end of the day, it's not that different than love. What do you mean? Minso asked. Well, you can't really get that angry if you don't care. If you're sure she still hates you, you probably still have a chance. She was talking to me. I knew she was, but she didn't know everything. 
She didn't know that I'd mourned the loss of Minso along with the rest of my family. She didn't know that I'd asked him to stay. She didn't know that he was the only thing I lost that elected to go. And somehow that made it hurt more. I'd had enough. I pulled myself through the doors to the kitchen and stood, earning a puzzled look from Lynn's bar hand. Lynn might have been right about love and hate, but I didn't hate Minzo. I just wanted him to leave and never come back. A few hours later, Gabriel and I returned to our house with a few Viren guards to escort us. Jun Ho had insisted. Annie, our closest neighbor, opened the door with a smile that faded when she saw Gabriel's bruised face. She was elderly with soft, wrinkled skin and a neat braid I'd watched turn from gray to white over the last few years. Her eyes were filled with understanding, but never surprise. Thank you, Annie, I said, handing her a silver coin. Did she give you any trouble? Nothing aside from the endless stories. That child could talk herself dizzy. Annie patted Gabriel gently on the back before hobbling out the door and back to her home a few yards away. She wasn't one for questions, which in a sense made her the perfect neighbor. I was glad to find Morgana asleep. I knew she'd worry when she saw Gabriel in such a state. I kissed her head and triple checked there were no candles lit near her room. When I returned to our bedroom to check on Gabe, he was already asleep. Not wanting to disturb him, I moved into our living room. Our house felt a little drafty, so I set a fire. I lay in front of it, feeling the warmth on my face as it grew in size, engulfing logs two at a time. I'd need to add some soon, but before I could, I'd drifted off to sleep. Gray haze again. The familiar warmth of the fire gone from my face. In an instant, I knew where I was. This was the place we met. A world so empty it could only possess one thing. Us. Young, I called into the emptiness. A gust of wind swirled around me, spinning the mist like a cyclone. Young, I called, scanning the empty horizons. Charlotte, I heard him call. I raced toward his voice, my heart beating wildly in my chest. I saw his silhouette in the mist just before he burst through, his hands reaching for mine. My body surged with warmth. A loud crash burst through the grayness, sending me crashing back to the waking world. Stunned, I shook my head to make sure I was awake. It was the door crashing loudly in its frame. Charlotte, Minso bellowed from outside. Afraid he'd wake Morgana or Gabriel, I leapt from the floor my blood boiling. I swung open the door. Minso stumbled back, swaying back and forth. He squinted at me. Charlotte, he slurred, and the prickle of ale filled my nose. Lower your voice, I warned. He stumbled forward, almost knocking us both over. Now in my house, I closed the door behind him and crossed my arms over my chest. You're drunk. Go home. Minso fell to his knees and sobbed. Charlotte, he whispered. I'm so sorry. I sat down in front of him. You don't have to do this. I'm fine. I made it. I didn't need you to stay. You don't understand, he said, his voice both strained and quiet. I lost my brother and you were hurting too. Don't, 
I whispered. I bit down on my bottom lip to stop from shaking. Tears lined his face. He was my brother. His breathing skipped. I couldn't be strong for you. I couldn't be the father of his child. I knelt in front of him, keeping him at an arm's length. Stop, I pleaded. He inched closer. I died with him, and so did you. So when I heard you were alive and that Arthur was hunting you, I knew I had to come. I lifted his face. And so, what do you want from me? Fall in love with me, he blurted, his eyes wet. I dropped my hand. I can't. I still love Young. I can't love anyone else. I know, he said, an inkling of a smile on his lips. He wiped his face on his sleeve in a way that reminded me of Morgana. But you can love me. I know it. We can bring each other back from the dead. I wasn't sure which, but one of the emotional daggers he'd tossed tonight had struck me and filled my body with a heaviness that reminded me of exhaustion. I'll never be able to love you like I love him. He shook his head. I don't want that. I want you to love me differently. Let's build something different. Maybe, his gaze brushed my cheek. Maybe love is different every time. It has to be. I tucked my hair behind my ear, my throat tightening. Please, Charlotte, I'm not young. I'll never be him, but I understand better than anyone how it felt to lose him. How it still feels. I reached out to touch his face, but stopped, clenching my hand into a fist and drawing it to my chest like a barrier. And I suppose you still want me to go with you to fires. You want me to throw away everything I've built and go back to the royal life that once took everything from me? He laughed. Yes, that would be ideal. I smiled. He was as ridiculous as he ever was. He laid his head on my lap, and in a few deep breaths, he was asleep. I'm sorry, Prince Minso of Fires. Love is over for me. Fifteen, Merlin. The church filled with awe as the veiled bride walked gracefully down the aisle. Her long, white dress glimmered in the sunshine, and a diamond-encrusted crown shone proudly atop her head. But the atmosphere didn't feel jubilant like it looked. My stomach quaked with nerves as the bride passed my seat in the pew. Then, as if I'd lost control over my body, I stood, pulling the attention of the room. I held my arms out toward the bride, unsure what my hands would conjure. Would it be wind, mist, or plant? What was I doing? My hands ignited, and blue flames shot from them, engulfing the bride. Her excruciating shrieks sent the room into a panic. I awoke with sweat beaded across my forehead. I looked down at my hands. Fire? It was an element I couldn't conjure, so why the dream? I wasn't able to get back to sleep after that, so I spent the dark bits of the morning training in the forest. Blue fire? Perhaps I was thinking about the dream too literally. The same sense of doom I'd felt in the dream remained throughout the morning and into the early afternoon. Even after I returned to the inn, I felt it under my skin, like a lurking demon waiting to strike. Are you all right? 
Lance asked, scooping a large bit of porridge into his mouth. I nodded. He put down his spoon. Look, if this is about that thing, I said- No, I said sharply. I had a vision. It was a wedding. He blanched. Whoa, 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 I said you were beautiful. That doesn't mean I set the bride on fire. He squinted his hazel eyes. Fire? That's a new trick. I stared at my hands. Remembering the euphoria I felt as the blue inferno manifested from them. A knock at the door startled me. Lance smirked at me as he stood to answer it. A young soldier stood at attention outside. Sir, the soldier said, you have mail. Finally, he said, thanking the man and taking his seat at the table. I felt my stomach tighten as his face gleamed as he opened it. My pulse quickened. Blue fire, blue fire, blue fire, in time with my heart. When his smile faded, I knew the dream had been an omen, and that the letter was here to deliver evil into our lives. I leaned forward, unable to wait. What is it? Arthur has chosen a wife. He wants us to return to his castle to ascend the ceremony. My stomach sank. Who do you think it is? He shrugged. Maybe some princess he's trying to make an alliance with. I reached out and put my hand on his. Lance, I have a bad feeling about this. Maybe we should skip it and resume our search for Charlotte. He may not be acting like it lately, but Arthur's like a brother to me. I know, but no, you don't, he said with such conviction it startled me. I promised him I'd never tell this story, but I need you to understand why he's more to me than a king. Why I'd do anything to serve him. I nodded, afraid to speak. After my parents died in the war with B His gaze scanned the room and he lowered his voice. The war at Heim's castle. Arthur convinced his family to take me in. For the next few years, we were raised like brothers. Arthur's father taught us his trade, blacksmithing, but neither Arthur nor I had much interest in it. We did, however, love sparring with the weapons. I inched my chair forward. Despite Arthur's boyish appearance, it was difficult to think of him as an ordinary kid, especially one with ties to Lance though it did explain why someone so inexperienced was given a knighthood quest. He continued, his gaze locked on his hands. More than anything, we loved to visit the sword Excalibur. For Arthur, it was a bit of magic in the dreary, unforgiving world. But for me, it was a way to change a man's fate. We made the climb to the sword every month, and it never budged an inch, until one day. Arthur pulled it, I said, the story finally catching up with what I knew. The silence dragged between us, and Lance's hazel eyes glinted more brown than green, his wide jaw flexed. Oh, I said, reading the hesitation on his lips. He didn't. He shook his head. It was like any other trip to the sword, only there was a man there. He was tall and had blonde hair, blue eyes, and a near permanent smile. My voice shook. Prince Emmet of Algony. Yes, he stepped to the sword and the sun cut through the overcast, illuminating him like a god. He lifted the sword as if it had always belonged to him. That's how Emmett became king. Lance said no, after Arthur explained to him that pulling the sword meant Emmett was the rightful king of Dreathen. Emmett tossed the sword aside. He claimed it was a stupid way to earn a crown and found his own sword to be of superior quality. In those days, Dreathen had a new king every week, each king dethroned by the next in a series of assassinations. With how often they were killed, it was amazing anyone wanted the job. 
but Emmett stepped right in, publicly challenging anyone who would oppose him. My heart thudded. The sword was our secret. We were too afraid to even speak about it until Emmett died. Drethen needed a king, and it was discovered that the sword was no longer in the stone. He sighed. With a slew of dead kings, I was too scared to take the sword to the castle and claim the title. But Arthur, with his belief that the magical sword would protect him, came forward, Excalibur in hand. And I vowed to protect him. After all, he had given me everything. I swallowed my disbelief. Then why hasn't he made you a knight? He must know that's your dream. Lance's expression softened, the green in his eyes returning. Like any good brother, he knows that if I don't earn it, it won't mean anything. You mean kind of how Arthur didn't earn the throne? Careful, Merlin, he spat. That sounds an awful lot like treason. How could it be true? How could the sword Excalibur have fallen into the hands of children under such bizarre circumstances? It had done its magic in uniting Drethen behind Arthur and helping him transform it into Camelot. But it could have been anyone. Even if Emmet had kept the sword, he might have been the true king. He might have survived his battle. The possibilities and potential outcomes swirled within me, and I found myself unable to accept reality as I knew it. Lost in thought and without another word, we packed for Bullhorn, the city once a part of Drethen, where Arthur's castle was the crown jewel of a glittering utopia. This was a mistake, maybe even dangerous, but the promise of a few stolen knights together with Guinevere blinded him from trusting my vision. The only other time I'd had such a powerfully negative vision was the night before we found Charlotte. Back then, I'd dreamt of Charlotte's location, the sign to Canterbury, clear as day. Only it was overgrown with plants, a dead and forgotten place. When I'd told Lance about it and warned him of the feeling, He'd disregarded it. He was too eager to catch Charlotte, so he'd barreled into Canterbury, questioning every passerby at knife point. Perhaps that's what had tipped her off. When we got to her home, she'd had cases of supplies loaded into a single horse wagon, and her home was engulfed in flame. Lance would have caught her that night if not for the frightening cry of a small child. I'd searched through the smoke and burning light, and there I'd seen a small girl covered in black ash, surrounded by flames. The world had slowed, and I'd breathed cool air into my lungs that hadn't come from my surroundings. I'd felt the flow of blood in my veins. A gust of misty air had started in my chest and left through my hands, smothering the fire around the child. I'd seen the little girl run to safety, picked up by a muscular man, before my vision blurred from overuse of my power. Lance had made a choice that night, to save my life rather than pursue Charlotte. Perhaps he regretted it and maybe carried it ever since. One thing was for sure. He would face another decision at the wedding, one that might result in the death of either him or his dream. 16. Minso. A deep voice boomed from behind me. Um, good morning. I awoke, my head still on Charlotte's lap as she slept soundly. I sat up, my shoulder aching where I had my weight on it all night. Gabriel stood over me, his blank expression as unreadable as the rest of him. I braced myself for impact, 
but he didn't hit me. My gaze drifted down to Charlotte, still asleep on the floor. I quickly stood, scrambling for the words, nothing happened, but the night before rushed back to me with each throb of my pulse. Except I confessed my love to your wife. He stared at me unbothered and said, Of course not. His easiness bothered me. Did he not know who I was? How could he not be threatened by me, not even a little? Didn't he care that I'd spent the night with his wife, under his roof? Suddenly, small footsteps sounded, and a tiny girl sprinted into the room. A touch of pink hit her cheeks as she peeked out at me from behind Gabriel's leg, her mop of curls spanning in all directions like warped rays of the sun. My pulse raced. She looked just like him. Wide-eyed, I leaned forward, and for a moment, I felt like I was looking at my little brother. All of the air left my lungs, and my eyes pricked. No wonder Charlotte couldn't let go. Uh, I said, I'm Minso. My gaze moved back to Charlotte, who lay still, but she had her eyes open, watching her daughter. The little girl remained behind Gabriel, but said, Do you like stories? I guess, I said, feeling Gabriel's gaze on my skin. Great, she yelled, a toothless grin on her face. She walked over to me and grabbed my hand, startling me. She led me to a chair. Sit here, she said. Once upon a time, there was an evil witch. Bewildered, I watched her. She was a little person, yet in the glitter of her eyes was the joy of a person who didn't live in the same world as I did. Gabriel took a seat beside me to watch the little girl's performance. Shall I make us all breakfast? Charlotte asked, prompting a scrunched up scowl from the little girl. Gabriel leapt from his chair. I'd better handle that. Why don't you come sit here and listen to Morgana's story? Morgana? The last time I heard that name, my brother spoke it. I watched Charlotte whisper something to Gabriel as he left, a devious smile on his face. What was that guy trying to prove? That I was no competition at all? Listen, Morgana demanded, her tiny hands on my cheeks. Oh, yes, sorry, I'm listening. But the prince didn't care that she was a witch or about the fire, she continued, because he had a terrible secret. I leaned forward. What was it? Morgana's face dropped. What was what? She whispered. Charlotte reluctantly took a seat beside me. What was his secret? I whispered back. Morgana sighed. I can't tell you because it's a secret. A secret means you can't tell the person. You're the person, so I can't tell you, she said. I laughed, which delighted her to no end. My participation seemed to fuel her performance, and I enjoyed egging her on to see what she'd do next. I had been right about one thing there was still a piece of my brother in this world. My focus drifted to Charlotte's hand, and I let myself imagine what this life would feel like. My gaze moved up her arm to her chest. She wasn't a scraggly teenager anymore. She was a woman and a mother. She'd lost the glow of an inexperienced girl facing the world for the first time, and instead saw the world as a dragon for her to slay. Her movements were sure and her strength didn't come and go like it did when I knew her. It was earned, hard fought. Years under the weight of grief had weakened me, but Charlotte wore it well. Heat burned my cheeks. I felt myself soften as she watched Morgana with loving eyes. Without thinking, I reached out for her hand. Before my fingers grazed hers, Gabriel entered, a tray in his hand. I stood quickly. Should I make a break for the door? Charlotte spoke first. Minso, are you okay? Y yes, I have to go and check in with my men. Charlotte pressed her lips together. 
I'll be back, of course. Two cold hands wrapped around my fingers. Promise? Morgana asked, staring up at me with my brother's eyes. I knelt. Of course, I had to find out what happens to the Juniper Witch. She squirmed in my arms. Junipi, she corrected. My heart warmed. My brother was never this friendly or outgoing. She was my brother in looks, but Charlotte in the soul. How about this, I said, my gaze briefly meeting Charlotte's. How about I take you, your mother, and your... I froze, looking nervously at Gabriel. My Gabriel? She asked. Yeah, that's right, you're Gabriel. Why don't I take you all to a special dinner? Her eyes widened. Tonight? Oh, that's very soon. Perhaps I should give your mother a break? Gabriel's deep voice filled the room. How's tomorrow? He added. Charlotte nudged him. What game was he playing? Whatever it was, I wasn't backing down. Tomorrow it is. I headed out into the crisp morning air, feeling free like my drunken confession had lightened my soul. Sure, the way it happened was embarrassing, but she knew how I felt, why I was here, what I wanted, and everything about that felt right. You! I turned to see Charlotte closing the door behind her. You can't just say that stuff last night and walk away like everything is normal. She let her curls fall into her face as if she could hide behind them. Why now, Minzo? After all this time, is this your way of coping with Young's death? To try and live the life he left behind? I sighed. I don't think I ever told you this, but I once challenged my brother for you. Her chin lifted, her mouth dropping open. I'm going to ignore all the problems I have with that for a second. What? I nodded. It seemed like a good idea at the time. What did he say? She asked, and the question stung. He said you were his wife. She turned away, and I let her stray to give her space. But there were so many things that needed to be said, things I couldn't bring myself to say when my brother was alive. I steeled my nerves. I remember waking up from being poisoned. Before then, I'd always thought of poison as a humane way to die, like drifting into sleep. But there was nothing humane about the searing pain of poisonous blood while my organs boiled. I would have welcomed a knife to the heart, even done it myself if I had strength enough. I waited for her response, and when it didn't come, I continued. Back then, I hated every choice Young made, risking his life for you and your kingdom before you were even married. Jealous, reckless, impulsive, all the things I'd never known my brother to be. I was certain it was insanity. I ran my hands through my hair. There I was, dying, caught in the crossfire of his insanity, and in you walk, the girl who caused it all. And worse, you just talked all the time. I'm wishing for death, and you're describing the color of the trees outside. I laughed, more grounded in my memory than the present. Day after day, you came back. I came back for him, she said coldly. Because of what you meant to Young. I blocked it out. She didn't want to remember. She'd forced herself to forget. You ran out of seasonal updates after the first few days. You waited until you thought I was sleeping to say anything real. Then, her gaze met mine. You spoke of your father, your desire for a normal life. You told me you felt alone. I held her gaze, her eyes glistening wet. It hurt to look at her. It hurt to continue my story. I clenched my jaw. I pretended to sleep for a week straight, 
waiting for you to fill in the gaps. Then one day it slipped. I whispered, why? You paused and I was certain that was the end, that you'd stop talking or return to updates about the weather. But you surprised me when you answered. We spoke from sunup to sunset every day for months. And before long, I knew you far better than my brother did. Stop, she whispered. I could tell by the way he spoke about you, like some immortal being. He didn't know how broken you were or how lost you felt. Stop it, Minso. You stop it, Charlotte. We did the best we could. You were a faithful and loving wife to my brother. You ignored my growing feelings for you, even though you knew. But you didn't stop coming to visit. Her gaze was cold. I didn't. And soon, I felt jealous, reckless, and impulsive. All the things I'd judge young for. I was so blinded by it that I raised my sword to my own brother, only snapping out of it long enough to watch him die. My breath sharpened. How could I stay with you then? I wasn't the man he was. I was an imposter that had fallen in love with my brother's wife. I didn't deserve a life with you, so I told myself you were dead. I said it to myself so often that I swear I watched you die. She exhaled hard enough to make me feel she'd faint if this went on much longer. It was a long time ago, Minso. We should let it all go. Exactly. I mean you and me. A lot has changed. I haven't been waiting for you all this time. I have a life and a family. And the fact that you'd come here to, I don't know, open old wounds means that you haven't grown or changed at all. So what? You're never going to love again? Don't you think we deserve one more chance at happiness? We were teenagers, still children in many ways, and we went through terrible things. We did the best we could at the time. But our lives are just beginning. You loved him until his last breath, despite the marriage being arranged. It's okay to let go. It's okay to be happy again. What makes you think I don't love my current husband? Why do you think it has to be you? I leaned in. Because you're still here with me, Charlotte. Just like you were then. You keep showing up. You might have even felt something for me back then, but you had a reason not to let yourself. Now you don't. Fall in love with me, Charlotte. She rolled her eyes. Wow. Sober and still spouting nonsense. I took a deep breath and smiled. To be honest, I don't feel totally sober yet. Her eyes darkened, and for a second, I thought she'd slap me again. But her anger flickered to sadness, and she turned away. I waited for her to speak, but after a long pause, she walked back to her house and vanished inside. 17. Lancelot There's no city like Bullhorn. It had been several years since I'd even set foot in it, and in that time it had grown even more luminous and modern. There were more trade routes, merchants, and goods from every corner of the world. The structures were built higher to accommodate the massive population. Arthur's trade deals and alliances brought Camelot from a broken and war-torn land to a kingdom unmatched by power or commerce. He had opportunized taking prisoners and forcing them into labor camps, and on their backs built more than any king before him. And he was only 16. As much as I'd struggled with the notion of how he became king and considered how easily I would have wound up on the throne instead, I had to admit he was a strong leader. Everyone had to. The castle towered above the city like a great white tower. Arthur had covered the gray stones that seemed a little out of fashion but made up the structure with some smooth white clay. The entire city stood in the shadow of his palace. I was nervous to see him, but this was made worse by Merlin's somber temperament. 
I wondered if she'd go as far as to mention to Gwen that I'd called her beautiful. I knew how women confided in each other. Would Gwen understand? Perhaps if I told her myself, if I told her I meant it as a friend. The carriage came to a halt outside the castle. A row of knights stood at attention to greet us and a row of guards behind them. Trumpets sounded as soon as my foot hit the stone path. It was just like Arthur to make a scene. Merlin followed closely behind. At the entrance of the white stone archway, King Arthur stood. His crown gleamed on a head of golden hair, his blue eyes bright with wonder. He looked too small for the fur-lined red cape that trailed behind him. Excalibur radiant, even sheathed on his hip. Jeremy! He beamed. I clenched my jaw. I mean Lancelot, he corrected, winking at me. He was still more boy than man, and perhaps he'd always looked that way to me. But when he wrapped his arms around me, I felt the same way I had when we first became brothers seven years ago. It was good to be home. Merlin, he said, opening his arms to her. Merlin had to bend down slightly to return his hug. How's the training coming? Very well, your majesty, she said. I found the question odd and wondered if there was a goal they shared that Merlin hadn't told me about, but it didn't matter. I was home, and even if it were just for a short time, it would be nice to visit the life I strived so hard to obtain. The inside of the castle was almost exactly as I'd remembered, but with one major difference. Every wall was covered in a great work of art or tapestry, and the floors were covered in fine rugs and furs. It was clear that Camelot was as teeming with wealth as it seemed, and Bullhorn was the center of the universe. All the wealth I'd witnessed on the streets was eclipsed by the gaudy castle interior that brimmed with treasure. Arthur led Merlin and me to our quarters, and we were allowed to bathe and rest for a few hours before a feast was to commence. But I couldn't rest. I needed to see Guinevere. I stalked through the hallway, relying on faded memories to direct me to her room. They led me to the end of the north wing, a wide hallway with a series of arched double doors that led to rooms belonging to the highest ranking members of the court. When I reached her room, Merlin's warning flashed through my mind. Blue fire. But everything I've ever wanted waited for me on the other side of this door. Guinevere. My mouth dried and I licked my lips, hoping to calm my nerves. I put my hands against the door and pushed. The door swung open. The ornately decorated room was empty. Though it still had furniture, the tabletops were as barren as the inns I now frequented. And what's more, there was no family crest hung on the center wall. All that remained was the dusty outline of where her crest once hung. Had they moved her room? What are you doing here? My heart leaped, and I spun to see Merlin outfitted in a corseted gown that had been dyed the deepest purple I'd ever seen. I know you're not worried, but let's stay together just in case. Why did she always have to talk like that? I sighed. We're not together, Merlin. I'm looking for Gwen. Merlin placed a hand on her hip. She's probably at the feast. We should be too. She held her hand out, but I slapped it away. Fine, I said. Let's go. We headed to the banquet, and an usher led us to a large table with golden cutlery and porcelain plates. The banquet had several large tables, but Arthur sat at the head of the longest, a boyish grin plastered to his face. The hall was filled with courtiers and foreign visitors, mostly not royal by blood, but gifted titles in exchange for friendship and allegiance to Arthur. Old money was out of fashion. In Camelot, opportunity lay at your feet, as long as you were beautiful, useful, or loyal. Where is Guinevere? I scanned each table one by one, 
but couldn't spot her. Lance, Merlin whispered. I have a bad feeling. Shut up, Merlin, I barked. Arthur sat at the end of the table, eight or nine people between us. He stood, and the guests quieted to listen to his speech. Drink some water, Merlin urged. On edge, I snatched the goblet from her hand and took a large gulp. Thank you for joining me on the eve of my wedding, Arthur said. I feel very fortunate to rule over such a prosperous kingdom, and I'm honored to be chosen by fate and merit rather than blood. A white haze washed over my eyes, Arthur continued. And let us all welcome my lovely wife-to-be, Guinevere. Trumpets sounded, drowning out the thrum of my heart. In walked my Guinevere, in a golden ball gown that glowed in the candlelight, her pink cheeks and hazel eyes as lovely as they'd been four years ago. Rattled with a mixture of dizziness, confusion, and despair, I swerved. Cheers! The crowd shouted. Dread seeped into my skin for one agonizing moment. Then Merlin leaned into my ear and whispered, Sleep. Everything went black. 18. Minso. Little brother, it's been five years since I last saw your face, and nearly the same since I've seen your Charlotte. I know this letter is an exercise in futility, but it helps to quell the near constant need I have to speak with you again. I take comfort in knowing you died without regrets, a death that has taught me much about how to appreciate life and its fleeting moments. After I lost you, I was as broken as Charlotte and quickly realized that I was not whole enough to console her. I offered her refuge in Vyers, and when she refused, I regrettably took my leave without regard for her safety or the cold of the winter that followed. When I'd finally accepted your passing, I sought her out, though I must admit I never expected to find her. I found it difficult to gather information about her whereabouts without revealing her former identity. My travels brought much news. What was once the land of Besmium had been swallowed by Drethen only to be renamed Camelot and ruled by a teenage tyrant named Arthur. After weeks of fruitless searching, I finally found Charlotte. I was relieved to find that she was not the dead-eyed widow I'd abandoned, but a woman of grace and silent strength. I stopped, unable to complete it. What can I say next? Should I ask his permission to pursue her? Should I mention Gabriel? I sighed and looked out the window as the day crept past at an unbelievably slow pace. Why couldn't it be tomorrow? Why did there always have to be another man between Charlotte and me? I put down my quill and stared up at the ceiling. A few minutes later, Junho entered. Oh, is this the letter for Charlotte? He asked, his dimples cutting into his cheeks. Of course not, I said. She has a husband. Junho sat on my bed and stared down at his hands. You don't know why I intervened in that fight the other day, do you? I pushed a hand through my hair. If you had let him die, I might have had a chance with her. Because you're a better man than I, I said, throwing a crumpled piece of parchment at him. But he didn't smile. I sat up in my chair, unnerved. It was because of the things those men were calling him. I replayed the incident in my mind, but no specific comment stood out. His voice shook. They chose to attack him because he likes men. Relieved, I exhaled. That's just something that people say. His gaze cut me. No, it isn't. But, but that's illegal. So is going after someone else's wife. He shook his head. My point is, if two people love each other, 
Why should that matter to anyone else? I stood. Wait, you don't seriously believe that Charlotte's husband prefers men? I do. Why would you even say that? Because I asked him. I sat beside him. And he admitted it? He nodded. My mind wandered to a meal I shared with Junho and Viers, with a man who'd watched him closely throughout the meal. My next question slipped out before I was ready to know the answer. Why would he tell you that? Junho didn't answer, and, in the silence, the answer hung between us. Because you told him you prefer men too. We sat in silence as I processed what this new information meant to me. It felt like something big, something hidden. And as I replayed moments where Junho hadn't lied but hadn't completely told the truth, he waited, a stone-like expression on his face. I don't, I started. I shook my head, organizing my words. I don't think that changes anything between you and me. His face flushed and we settled into an empty silence. If I recalled correctly, this was exactly the kind of uncertainty Charlotte's world always carried. Wait, I sat up. Does Charlotte know? He leaned forward with a huge smile. I must have seemed slow to him. There were so many things happening that I wasn't aware of. His dimples pressed on his face. That's actually why I'm here. I'm certain she knows. That's probably one of the reasons they decided to team up. So if you're thinking of using Gabriel as a reason not to try and work things out with Charlotte, let me be the first to put a stop to it. This is a lot, I said, running my hands through my hair. He nodded. So what's the plan? I guess I'll have to prepare something special. He sucked in air sharply. I have a great idea. He sprinted out the door and returned several minutes later, dragging a large sack with him. What is it? He reached inside and pulled out a handful of wilted cherry blossoms, the ones Merlin had conjured. Excitement surged through me, but quickly faded. I remembered the look in Charlotte's eyes the last time we spoke. I remember the pain our conversation caused her. Gabriel was more of a man than I'd given him credit for. He'd stepped into Charlotte's life, put her back together, and helped her raise her child. All the things I ran from. I cringed. I had accused Charlotte of moving on too quickly, when she never moved on at all. When would I stop messing up? After going over my past, all hopes of a romantic evening were dead. What was I even thinking? I knew there was no chance of Charlotte falling in love with me, and certainly not of coming back with me to Vyers. What I was asking her was impossible. What I'd done to her all those years ago was cruel. Some of the things I'd said to her more recently were unforgivable, especially in regards to Gabriel. Even now, as I planned this elaborate dinner to win her, it seemed to reduce the gesture to a mere trick. So what then? I lay back on my bed. Junho laughed. Don't lose nerve now. She already said she can't love me. Junho sighed. Fine then. Don't prepare this dinner because you want her to love you. Do it because you're sorry. I stared at the ceiling. I just want to be what she needs. And what do you think she needs? I put my hands in my hair. That's the thing. I don't think she needs anything. He lay beside me. I disagree. I think she needs a friend. We lay in silence, our minds drifting like a branch in a stream. Minso, Junho said suddenly. Thank you for, uh, listening, for understanding. I closed my eyes. Thanks for telling me. As we lay side by side, 
I wondered where I would have been four years ago if it weren't for Junho. He'd always been there. He'd been carrying around a secret, afraid of what I might do or say. The only reason he dared share with me now was to help me with Charlotte. The more I thought about it, the more friendship seemed worthy to offer Charlotte. I could swallow my feelings for her sake. I'd done it before. A knock sounded at my door, startling Junho and me. I hurried over and pulled the door open to find Hanbit, nervously fingering a letter. This came for you, he said, handing it to me. It's from your father. I took the letter, trying not to read the look in Hanbit's eyes that screamed the same thing my mind did. It's always bad news. I ripped open the letter and held my breath as I scanned it, Junho's gaze burning the back of my head. Son, the doctor has discovered the reason for Suman's infertility. He's not well. You need to return to Vyres immediately. Sincerely, your father. Suman? Strong, brave Suman isn't well. I could only recall a handful of conversations I'd had with him since Young died. He always seemed cold and disconnected, but I wondered if he'd been sick all along and I was too consumed in my own sorrow to notice. I wasn't sure how bad things were. My father didn't specify, but the fact that he'd signed it, your father, worried me. Was I going to lose another brother? Junho and Hanbit waited hardly breathing as I sorted through the news. My brother is sick. They want me to come home, I said, unable to process the words as I said them. Junho took me by the arm and led me to the bed. He guided me into a seated position. Deep breath, he said. I tried, but the air stung, caught in my lungs and stabbed at my head. How bad is it? Hanbit asked, earning a malicious glare from Junho. I held up the letter and Hanbit and Junho leaned together to read it. Hanbit blinked wildly. I'll prepare the men for the trip, he said. Wait. I held my arm out. Just wait. I rubbed my palm across my face. I can't go, I said. Hanbit shook his head. But, but you must. It's an order from the king. You might become the only living heir to the Viren throne. He said no, Junho barked. Now get out. I reeled in silence, and Junho paced in front of the door. I wasn't going to leave Charlotte again. I didn't care if she'd never forgive me. I didn't care if she never loved me. I was at a crossroads one similar to the one I'd faced five years ago. But even if I defied my father, even if I wasn't there for Suman, and no matter what the cost of this decision, I knew this time, I'd choose Charlotte. I'd choose Charlotte every day for the rest of my life. 19. Merlin Lancelot lay serenely on his arm at the banquet table as the feast commenced. Whenever his seemingly lifeless body drew the attention of one of the courtiers, I faked a laugh and offhandedly mentioned, you know how soldiers are with their wine, an explanation that seemed to instantly quell their worried faces. The room got louder as the party reached its full swing. In fact, I spotted several other people with their heads down on the table from drinking too much a blonde with curls pinned to her head and a soldier with a vaguely familiar crest. There was no reason for anyone to suspect that I'd drugged Lancelot, but Arthur knew. The king eyed Lance from the head of the table, no doubt disappointed by his lack of reaction. An hour later, when Lancelot hadn't moved, Arthur's glances at me indicated he knew I'd intervened. It was all too cruel. Guinevere didn't so much as glance at her former love once throughout the feast. 
She smiled like a blushing bride-to-be while she chatted with her sisters. All as red-haired and lovely as her, but only she would be queen. Arthur could have chosen any of them and spared Lance. This was intentional. I sucked in frustration. They hadn't even warned him. I shuddered to think what hot-blooded thing Lance might have done if I hadn't intervened. Attack the king? Be executed for it? I felt my power surge inside me, and my thoughts returned to the dream. I was angry enough at Gwen to set her on fire, and she certainly deserved it. But fire-wielding was not among my abilities. When the first few courtiers left the party, I knew it was a good time to pull Lance out of there. I supported his weight on my hip and slung his arm over my shoulder. I used precise gusts of wind to help move his legs and lift some of his weight. And in a few minutes, I laid him down in his chamber. Still furious, I hurried back into the hallway and wandered aimlessly through the castle. It seemed so empty outside of the ballroom and dining hall. All the guards must have been enjoying the party since everyone important was there. Before I knew it, I was pushing open door after door, searching for the lion-scented crest of Guinevere's house. Six rooms, seven, eight. Finally, I pushed through and froze as I stared up at her crest on the back wall. But this room could have belonged to one of Guinevere's sisters. I wasn't convinced it was hers. I pushed open the door to another chamber, the crest again, another, and another. Finally, I pushed open a chamber where the crest was hidden behind a long, white ball gown and veil. I stepped into the room, closing the door behind me. My heart beat a warning. Blue fire. Blue fire. I climbed into the closet without an idea of what I was doing there. I shook, my mind drifting to my mother's face. She's a witch, she'd said. Kill this ungodly child. Blue fire, blue fire, blue fire. I felt sparks burn the palms of my hands, and a blue glow filled the closet but my mind was too occupied. Guinevere should pay for what she did, I seethed. With a huff that reminded me of a candle burning out, a pale blue flame flickered in my palm. I gasped as new energy surged through me. It stung in my blood like spice in the mouth. One gust of wind against the flame was all it would take to ignite her. The creak of the door startled me as Gwen's footsteps sounded in the room. I heard the scratch of her gown on the floor and an exasperated sigh. I gazed at the flickering blue flame in my palm. Witch, I heard my mother say. But I was not. I took as deep a breath as I could in the silence and closed my hand into a fist snuffing out the flame and stepping out of the closet. She gasped. Merlin, you shouldn't be here, she said, a quiver of fear in her voice. Guinevere, I said, unable to make eye contact. You should have at least warned him. She sat on her bed, a move of surrender, her gold and white dress a puffy cloud around her. He was gone. I don't want to hear it, I said, feeling my palm spark. I calmed myself with another deep breath. Whatever your reason, it's him that you owe the explanation to. I stepped closer. And you will explain yourself to him. She straightened her posture. You dare threaten the future queen of Camelot? I dare threaten the weak and helpless bitch. I held my hand out with the blue flame hovering just above it. 
that could be turned into a pile of ash if I breathe too hard. She stared into the flame, a mixture of wonder and fear in her eyes. Then she turned away. Her gaze got distant as if she'd remembered something. Something that had nothing to do with my threats. She sighed sweetly. I'll talk to him. 20. Charlotte. Minso. Infuriating. What did he expect? I pulled on my dress, slipping my arms into it and reaching around my back for the ribbons. How could two brothers be so different? How? And there he was, lecturing me about how I'd edited my memories? I scoffed. Wasn't he with Millie? Huh, he'd conveniently left that out of his little speech. I laced up my dress, cinching it harder than I usually did. Sure, Young was hard to know. He hardly spoke at all, but it only took a few minutes to know what kind of man he was. A man of honor, brimming with empathy and selflessness. Minso was the opposite, always running a game. Even if we'd spoken every day since we'd met, I wouldn't know what his intentions really were. Only that wasn't completely true, was it? When I replayed those memories, I saw something new. I saw how he started to look at me back then. I heard the softness in his voice, felt the heat of his gaze on my face. Had I always known about his feelings? Had I continued to visit him despite them? Maybe I was to blame. I sighed as I gazed at my reflection. I was not a princess, but a woman who once made decisions without considering others. I pulled my curls out of my face. Why would they never look the way I wanted? But I was too tired to fix them. I pushed open the door to the living room. How's this one, I said, stepping out of the bedroom. Beautiful, Morgana exclaimed. I twirled. Gabe flipped a page in his book and, without looking, said, It's just as nice as the other seven. Wait, I said. Let me try one more. You know, I heard Gabriel say, If I didn't know any better, I'd say you have a thing for Minso. I stepped back into the living room. What thing? Morgana asked, climbing into Gabriel's lab. I don't. I just want to feel good. Strong, you know? So part of you feels weak around him? Enough. He closed his book. Why are you fighting this? Anyone can see that there's something there. You have a chance to be happy. Morgana scrunched her nose. What's there? I am happy. I walked over and threw myself into a chair. Why doesn't anyone think that I'm happy? I felt the tug of tiny hands on my arm. Like this, Morgana said, baring her missing teeth like a lion ready to attack. See, Gabriel said smugly, like that. A knock at the door sounded. Quick, I whispered, tie this. Gabriel hurried over and tied the two strings on the back of my dress into a bow. Morgana threw the door open. Minso, she yelled, throwing her arms around his knees. Morgana, he knelt in front of her, handing her a pink flower. You look beautiful. She twirled. I looked over at Gabriel, whose face said it all. No outfit on earth was going to make me strong enough for this. Minso stood and his gaze moved to me. He took a deep breath before he spoke. You look nice too, he said, handing me a pink flower. Ah, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a letter, handing it to Gabriel. Juno asked me to give this to you. Morgana pulled on Minso's jacket until he took her hand. 
I forced myself not to smile. Gabe opened the letter, and we stood in uncomfortable silence as his eyes skimmed the page. Finally, he laughed, looking down at his hands. He turned to Minso. He can tell by my hands? Minso shrugged, and Gabriel disappeared into the bedroom, emerging a minute later with a wooden lute. Things felt different today. It might have been Morgana's presence putting us all at ease, or maybe Minso and I were tired of the battle. But somehow our little group set out together for dinner. It was just a meal, but food had always been synonymous with family, a thought that pushed me back and forth between calm and nervous, like the waves of yellow grains in the wind. Minso led us to the forest's edge near a pond, not unlike Gabriel had a few weeks before. I began to suspect a conspiracy. Morgana and Minso chatted hand in hand as we drew closer. Morgana stopped. It's magical, she screamed, and she took off in a sprint toward the pond. The pond and surrounding areas were covered in tiny white flower petals. Candles floated on the pond's surface, the reflection of flickering light peeking through the spaces between the petals. A large quilt was set out, and on it, an array of carved fruits and pastries that, by the smell, were undeniably made by Lynn. Careful, Gabe called after her, hurrying to catch up. Minso stopped, and in a few steps, we stood side by side. For the first time that night, we had a few minutes alone. The sun started to set, illuminating our picnic in gold. It's beautiful, I said. Thank you for doing all this. It's my pleasure, he said. We walked toward the pond, the back of his hand mistakenly brushing mine. He stopped. Charlotte, I just wanted to apologize for everything. For leaving, for that stuff I said the other day. I know a fancy picnic doesn't make up for any of that, but I just want you to enjoy yourself. There's no pressure. He bit his bottom lip. There are no expectations. My stomach fluttered as the handsome prince returned. I felt more than nervous. I felt scared. Words. I needed words. Okay, I managed. His face brightened, a gust of wind pushing his hair out of his eyes. He looked a lot like he did when we'd first met. Confident, handsome, devious. Half in memory, like I'd done that day. I turned to when I'd first seen young, but of course. I gazed out at the open air. Minso smiled down at me. I can't look at you without thinking about him, too. I shook my head. I, uh, I'm, he touched my face. It's okay. We both loved him. He put his arm around my shoulder casually. Are you going to be this tongue-tied all night? He asked as he led me toward the others. I smiled away my nerves as we took a seat on the quilt by the others, but the flutter in my stomach remained. 21. Lancelot. I awoke out of breath, like from a nightmare. I looked around my candlelit room and calmed, before the sudden rush of memories crashed down on me. The wedding. Gwyn. Lance, I heard her say. I turned to see her seated on the other side of the bed. How could, why did? I flailed. My eyes felt heavy and so did my limbs, and it wasn't a minute before I realized I'd been drugged. But the what's and the why's of it had to wait. Gwen was here. She looked down at her hands, her auburn hair amber in the candlelight. I should have told you. How long has this been going on? 
I asked breathlessly. It doesn't matter how long, I shouted. Just this year. A year? I stood and began pacing, blood drained from my face. You sent me letters. You were gone a long time. I tried to wait. Tried? It's not just about that, Lance. He's offering me the throne of the most powerful kingdom in the world. I turned to her. Is that it? That's enough for you? She inched back on the bed, but I stepped closer. Do you love him? She broke eye contact. I lifted her chin and whispered, Do you still love me? Tears touched her pink cheeks. I squatted, wiping them away. It's okay, I whispered. It's okay. She shook as she cried into my chest. I'm sorry, she sobbed, her voice muffled. Her breath was warm. She lifted her chin to my ear. I'm sorry. Slowly, they moved to my neck. She kissed it, sending a frigid chill through my body. I'm sorry, she whispered again, her bottom lip dragging across my skin. Lance, she breathed, come here. I ignored the pain that had shattered every nerve, the thought of her with Arthur. I felt my soul leave my body, and only her lips could breathe me back to life. I felt dazed, half of me still waking. The warmth of a breath on my neck thrilled, sending me to the purgatory between awake and asleep. I pushed her back onto the bed and pulled my shirt off, each impulse as thoughtless as the last. She pulled me down to her. I kissed her with a mix of all the anger and love I felt. I needed her to remember, to love me. I tasted her neck like I'd imagined night after night, for the years we were apart. She arched her back and moaned a sound so rapturous I stopped to watch. Yes, Guinevere, don't hold back. I want Arthur to hear this. I awoke to an empty room. My body was numb and my eyes were swollen from crying. I recalled the night before. Even after that, you're still going to marry him? I yelled as she scrambled back into her dress. You act like I have a choice here. Arthur will never let us be together. Her voice cracked. He'll kill you. I grabbed her wrists. Say you don't love me, and I'll let you marry him. Say it. She pulled her hands away. I won't. After she left, I cried myself dry, leaving an empty space where love and sorrow once were. I didn't remember falling asleep, only waking to a world where Guinevere had chosen Arthur. Become a knight, she'd whispered. I heard Arthur say she's in Wellwood. But all I could hear was Arthur's name on her lips. What was the point? Did she mean that we'd continue seeing each other behind closed doors? I shuddered. A knock sounded at my door and my heart pounded back to life. Gwen. I swung open the door to see Merlin, her eyes glittering with worry. Can I come in? She asked, as my heart sunk with disappointment as her somber expression breathed truth into all the events of last night. It was real. Gwen was going to marry Arthur. You look like hell, she said. I nodded, unable to put together real words. We sat together on my bed. Her pity nauseated me. Or maybe I was sick from the leftover drug. At some point in the course of the morning, I put together what happened, what Merlin had done. Either way, there was no denying she'd done me a favor. Thank you for what you did last night, I mumbled. Oh, yeah. She pushed a pastel braid behind her ear. 
I figured she owed you an explanation. My thoughts raced. I meant about drugging me. Did you tell Gwen to come to my room last night? She nodded. At least you have closure. You can move on. I stood. Closure? I know more than ever that she loves me. I sighed. But she's going to marry Arthur anyway. She shook her head in disbelief. Whatever, now you can let her go. I clenched my jaws, my thoughts turned to Gwen. Become a knight. Merlin hit her palm on the doorframe. Did something happen? I swallowed, and her eyes widened. In an instant, she was out the door. It slammed behind her with such force that I worried the frame would crack. 22. Minsau. Gabriel strummed a slow tune on the lute that seemed to descend the sun and scale its shining counterpart. Morgana tossed flower petals in the air, casting imaginary spells at the forest's edge. The candlelit pond was the only orange left of the night as the moon poured a silver glow over Wellwood. I sat beside Charlotte and watched her sway to the melody. She sighed. This is nice. Good, I said. I lay on my back and looked up at the stars. They seemed brighter in Vyres, but more beautiful here. Charlotte lay beside me, moving close enough that the top of her head touched mine. My pulse raced from her close proximity. Friends, I reminded myself. I wondered if I should tell her about the letter from my father, or if it would add pressure. I didn't want her to worry. I didn't dare interrupt the peace we'd finally found. Do you know any constellations? She asked. I smiled. Of course. I pointed to the sky. Do you see the bright ones there and there? She pointed above her. This one? No. I took her hand and traced a shape in the sky. She giggled and I felt heat rush to my face. Here, I said. This is a juicy bowl of banana soup. She laughed. You liar. My cheeks were sore from smiling. I turned my head to see her beaming back at me, our hands still joined in the air, my smile fading along with hers as our fingers tangled together. My heart thudded against my ribs. Slowly, our hands moved down toward us, intertwined, until locked together on the ground by our sides. I swallowed nervously as her chest rose and fell in time with mine. Friends, my mind screamed. Friends. I inched closer. I felt the warmth of her breath on my lips. I put my forehead to hers. Her eyes closed, a touch of a smile at the corner of her mouth. Her mouth. Did I dare? Stop me, Charlotte. I slid my free hand to the back of her neck. Just say no, Charlotte, and I'll stop. I gazed at her lips. Stop me, Charlotte, I thought, but she didn't. Her lips parted, pulling me in. I'm sorry, Charlotte. I can't just be your friend. I never could. I leaned in. A bone-chilling scream sounded from the forest. We sat up, dizzy from a shattered trance. Gabriel sprinted toward the forest, Charlotte and me close behind. Morgana! Charlotte screamed. The forest beamed with a sudden orange light. Black smoke swirled into the fresh air. Ash rained from the sky like falling stars. Morgana sprinted from the forest, tears pouring from her eyes. She leapt into Gabriel's arms. My hands, my hands, she cried. We caught up to them to find Gabriel pressing her small hands to his face. What's wrong, baby? Charlotte cried, pulling her into her arms. My hands, Morgana cried. Gabriel shook his hands. 
Her hands are cold. She wasn't burned. The wind changed direction, pushing smoke into our faces. How did the fire start? I said as the flames moved toward us. Gabriel covered his face. Maybe she grabbed a candle? I shook my head. A candle can't do this. He turned to me. Minso, run into town, ring the bell, get some help. We need to put this out before it spreads. Six hours later, Morgana slept soundly in her bed, covered in soot and ash. Charlotte, Gabriel, Junho, Jaehyun, and I sat in a circle in the living room, exhaustion heavy on our limbs. With the help of almost 20 strangers, we managed to put out the fire. But how had it started? I better get back to the inn, Junho said, standing. I'm glad no one was hurt. Junho cleared his throat, breaking Gabriel from his exhaustive days. Oh, yeah, I'm going to turn in for the night too, Gabriel said. Gabriel headed into the bedroom, waving goodnight before he left. Taking his cue, Jae Hyun opened the front door, the wind still heavy with the scent of burning wood. Good night, he said as Jun Ho followed him out and closed the door behind him. I turned to Charlotte. Listen. About earlier, it's a sign, she said solemnly. I moved next to her. The fire? Yes. She turned to me with tears in her eyes. Young doesn't want us to be together. I took her hands in mine. So he tried to light his own daughter on fire? She covered her face with her hands. That doesn't make any sense. She wiped her face, soot smudging across it. How could we be happy when he died for us? She stood. Wait, 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 Charlotte. We'll figure this out. Don't panic. I'm sorry, she said. She covered her mouth with her hand and pushed the door to her bedroom open, closing it behind her. 23. Merlin I knocked on Arthur's door, his guards watching me closely, as if they could stop me if I decided to kill him. The doors opened and Arthur grinned at me. Merlin, to what do I owe the pleasure? I've done it. He blinked vacantly, combing his blonde hair forward with his fingers. You did what? His eyes bulged. Fire? I held my hand out, a blue flame at the center of my palm. He leaned in, looking more like a child than ever. It's so blue, and your eyes as well. How strange. The fire snuffed out. Really? Oh, brown again, he said. Your Highness, I wonder if you'd permit me the use of the cellar to practice. And a leave of absence from your wedding today. Certainly, certainly, he said. I'm happy to see such progress. He touched his hair again. Ah, my crown. He looked over his shoulder. You, bring me my crown. A guard disappeared into the king's quarters. How is Lancelot's hunt for the girl? He should have found her by now. I eyed him. You know where she is. How much can I be expected to hand him? I was certain he would have found her by now. He sighed. What was the key to unlocking this new power? I eyed my hands. I'm not sure exactly, but the feeling is getting stronger. Perhaps my power is somehow linked to Charlotte's. I felt something similar when we'd almost caught her two years ago, though no flame manifested. I'm sure she's connected somehow. When she arrives, I'll be sure to get her up to speed, but it's likely that she'll help me develop my own powers as well. Maybe you should send someone else to get her, someone with a brain between his ears. I see the hero worship has finally worn off. He sighed. Oh, Jeremy, he said. Same thing happened with him and Gwen. 
Speaking of whom, I better get ready for the ceremony. Which, I heard my mother say as I considered outing Guinevere. But as much as Lancelot had hurt me, I knew I'd never bring myself to hurt him. He'd surely be killed for it when Guinevere was to blame. How much time had I spent helping Lance with his quest when I could have been training? How much sooner could I have unlocked this fire? Lance wasn't the answer. He'd always mistreated me, moping about as he did. Show me a man worthy of me. Until then, I'll not lower myself to fit someone less. I'd meant the words, but the sting from the last few days lingered. Perhaps instead of finding love with Lancelot, I could make a sister out of Charlotte. We shared the same gift, the same burden. Perhaps all I ever wanted was for someone to understand. I headed to the cellar, the place where I'd spent so many hours training before I'd embarked on Lancelot's knighthood quest. A stone spiral staircase led down to the chambers of varying size. I skipped down one flight after the other, deeper underground. The area was lit with wall torches and had broken stone from where the iron cells had been pried out. Once used as a dungeon of sorts, the cellar was now as vacant as Lancelot's eyes when I'd last seen him. Arthur loved taking prisoners, but he'd discovered early on that working prisoners built a kingdom, not captive ones. He set up prison camps for manual labor and had all Camelot's prisoners sent there. He even had prisoners carted in from his allies. I heard a rumor that he held a special group of captives somewhere in the castle, but I'd discovered little evidence of that. For now, the cellar was mine alone, and with grey stone covering every surface, there was a low chance I'd damage anything, but there again, I wasn't sure exactly how powerful I was now. I inhaled deeply and felt the warm blue glow on my palm. If I combined it with wind, could I shoot it? I took a deep breath and conjured a short gust. The flame snuffed out. I tried again with varying levels of intensity, but each resulted in a flame weaker or dead. What if I didn't combine them? What if I tried increasing the intensity of the flame itself? I focused on the tingle at the center of my palm. I pushed my life energy into it. It swelled a flash bigger and then settled back into its original form. Ah, that was difficult. How could I maintain enough energy to make it useful? If Arthur saw that weak attempt, he'd likely demote me from battle mage to castle candle lighter. I tried again, this time pushing every bit of power to my palm. The teal wave blazed, engulfing my hand. It felt like pure energy and tingled in a way that might make a small child giggle with delight. More power, I beckoned. The flame flared. Suddenly, the sleeve of my shirt caught, burning red. I screamed as it seared my skin. I shook my hand wildly, too panicked to use another spell to help. I slapped the flame out and my skin still stung near the edges of the burnt sleeve. Suddenly, my eyes glazed over, my vision teleporting me to a night two years ago. In the eye of my mind, the orange fire blazed, and the little girl screamed in fear. Using every ounce of power I had, I pushed the flames away. A man carried the girl to Charlotte who watched me with troubled eyes. I blinked myself back to the cellar. That night, Charlotte had lost control of her power as well. I eyed my singed sleeve, a smudge of burn where the fabric had lit. I get it. Blue fire is good, and red is bad. 
24. Charlotte. I sat in the empty living room, tempted to check back on Morgana for the tenth time since I woke up. She was sleeping soundly, not a single mark on her hands. What had happened? I brushed her hair out of her face. I tilted my head back and breathed deeply. I was Morgana's mother. I didn't have the luxury of falling in love. Not again. My baby almost got hurt. Even with two adults watching, I let myself drift for one second and almost lost her. Where was it? Where was the strength I'd been building all these years? My thoughts drifted to Minso, a nervous flutter at the pit of my stomach. I'd wanted him to kiss me, and everything about that felt wrong. Why couldn't I push him from my mind? Did I just miss the rush of falling in love? Minso had been right about one thing. This was different than what I had with Young. I didn't feel the warmth, calm, or peace I'd felt with him. I didn't feel the heaviness or the depth. Young's love was all-consuming and endless. Minso's was easy, light. It was full of life in a world where I'd only known death. He sparkled with charm and charisma. It didn't always feel sincere, but it felt good. It felt so good, until the guilt set in. Questions rose much quicker than answers. Why couldn't I stop comparing them? Had I always been attracted to Minso? Did Young know this would happen? I opened the bedroom door. I'm headed out for a bit, I said. Morgana's asleep. Gabriel rolled over and waved his hand. I left the house, closing the door quietly behind me. I headed out along the path I'd walked so many times before, but this time I dreaded what I'd feel when I arrived. I entered the clearing, the magnolia tree blooming near the top. Trudging through the overgrown weeds, I put together what I wanted to say. I put the palm of my hand against the tree. Hello, love, I said. Minso's back. I sighed and took a seat, leaning back against the trunk. I know, of all the men in the world. The wind picked up, tossing my curls into my face. He makes me feel like I'm still alive, that there's more life ahead of me. I swear, for a while after I lost you, maybe even until recently, I've been waiting to die, just barely surviving. I exhaled. I want to live. I want to fall in love with him. It was the first time I'd said it out loud, and it startled me. My eyes teared. Tell me it's okay. I listened, but all I heard was the rustle of the branches in the gentle breeze. Please, I whispered. Tell me it's okay. The sun rose as I walked along the path to my house, and in the distance where the path diverged, I could see Jun Ho and Minso headed up to visit. Minso's gaze met mine, a soft smile on his face. His eyes glittered with hope. My stomach fluttered, distracting me from the sound of heavy footsteps behind me. Charlotte, someone said. Startled, I turned to see a wide-framed soldier, his brown hair shining in the rising sun his hazel eyes more vibrant than the sky behind him. I knew this man. I pulled my dagger. Lancelot. He didn't so much as look at the dagger. My orders are to take you alive, but that doesn't mean conscious. 
The choice is yours. Come with me willingly, or I'll hurt you. What does Arthur want with me? I just want to live the rest of my life in peace. You have something he wants. Take it! It's not something that can be given. I screamed. What is it? He glared back, stone-faced. That's between you and the king. Lance's gaze moved beyond me. Minso's footsteps and heavy breathing came up behind me. I know you, Minso said with a smile. Lance, right? Minso held his hand out, but Lance slapped it away. It's Lancelot. Where was Jun Ho? Didn't I see him with Minso earlier? Ah, getting help. Minso stretched his hands over his head. So, um, where's your girl? She's not my girl. Minso nodded. Ah, you broke up. Lance drew his sword. I'm taking Charlotte. Look, man, I'm sorry your girl left, but shut up. Minso turned to me, his eyes calm and his demeanor as casual as ever. Uh, I left my sword at the inn. Can I borrow your dagger? I winced at the absurdity. If Minso pushed Lance any further, we would both die here. I eyed the direction where the Viren guards were sure to come charging in. Any minute now. He's trying to take me alive. It's better if I fight him, I said, turning back to Lance. Stop stalling, Lance barked, lunging at me. I leapt back, surprised by his force. What was he doing? That could have easily killed me. I swung my dagger at him. He caught my wrist and twisted. I screamed, the dagger flying out of my hand. Before I could pull my hand away, Minso's fist connected with Lance's cheek, and he stumbled back, stunned. Oh, do that, Minso said. Lance wiped at his cheek like he could sweep the pain off. You, I can kill. He swung his sword down. Minso slid across the dirt path and scooped up the dagger just as Lance swung down with a second blow. Minso deflected it with the dagger, but his arms shook. This was bad. Stop, a voice called from behind us. The clang of moving metal filled the air as the Viren soldiers ran to us. Lance gritted his teeth. Why this stupid mission? Lance's arms slacked. As Jae Hyun and the other guards reached us, they leapt in front of Min So while Jun Ho handed him his missing sword. 25. Min So. Rusty and weak. How long had it been since I'd adequately trained? Those daily drinking binges and wallowing in fires had taken their toll on me. Granted, having a sword could have evened the odds a bit, but I wasn't confident that I could actually take that guy. What's worse is Charlotte saw everything. The sucker punch and my looming defeat. If my guards hadn't arrived, I could have lost Charlotte. We were lucky he was alone this time. With Merlin, he would have crushed us, guards included. Lance threw his arms out in surrender. So what's it going to be? He said, glaring at me. I'll get a few more guys and come kill you and your ridiculous friends. I took a deep breath. Sir Lancelot, was it? Lancelot. So this is your knighthood quest. I nodded to myself. Capture Charlotte. Lance sheathed his sword. You understand why it's essential that I take her then. I understand that you're supposed to complete a knighthood mission alone. Thus why knights are superiors to soldiers here in Camelot. Lance bristled. I'm not sure why your king let you take your girlfriend along, but in any case, she's gone. Charlotte is under the protection of Vyres now. You can either fight all 11 of us by yourself or get a new dream. Fine, Lance said. Fine what? 
He stepped forward. I'll fight all 11 of you, one on one. I giggled. That would be the honorable way to do it, wouldn't it? I smiled. You know, my brother Young was an honorable man. That's the kind of deal he would have made. I tilted my face up at the sun. Unfortunately for you, I'm not honorable, and I'm certainly not the kind of man he was. Lance shook, and for a moment I wasn't sure if he would attack me or cry. The bulky swordsman he'd been a minute prior dissolved into a teenager mid-tantrum. I breathed relief when he turned and walked off in the direction from when she came. Prince Minso of Vyres, he said, looking over his shoulder. I'll kill you someday. Later then, I said. I turned to Charlotte. Are you hurt? She shook her head. I nodded. He was lucky we've been out of practice. We'll get him next time, I said. You think he'll be back? Without a doubt. Charlotte turned to my men. Thanks for coming. I'll make everyone breakfast. We walked back to Charlotte's house with the energy of a triumphant victory while a lonely soldier returned defeated to Bullhorn. I'd known that kind of defeat. I'd lived it for a long time. I should have thought about what could be born from that level of despair. I should have taken responsibility for my part in feeding the beast. Junho, Jaehyun, and the other soldiers entered Charlotte's house before us, but she stopped me before I went in. Minso? She grinned. Want to see my garden? If that's some kind of innuendo, yes. Of course, I said, and she led me around the house to the back. A large kitchen garden sat tucked away behind the house. It had rows of leafy stalks and flowers beginning to bud. It was preened, and the way Charlotte beamed told me that she'd done it herself. These are hydrangeas. They'll be big and blue in a month's time. She knelt next to a leafy row, pulled a large carrot from the soil, and handed it to me. Lovely, I teased, dusting the dirt from it. I know, she said too loudly. Those are called buttercups. They're yellow. I found them by the river and replanted them here. And what did you name these? I said, pointing to a green patch. She rolled her eyes. That's lettuce. Pick one, will you? We picked several of her spring vegetables and carried them into the house. It was the kind of work I'd never done. I hadn't even watched anyone do it, but I'd never imagined it could bring someone such joy. Perhaps Charlotte was happy about our defeat of Lancelot. Or maybe she was happy for another reason. The soldiers didn't fit well in the house, but they sat cheerfully around the room as Morgana treated them like her personal toys. I laughed at how she looked, ordering them about, and how they listened. She was a princess of Vyres through and through. Charlotte cooked, and before long, she hummed a familiar melody that I couldn't place. So you're just going to toss them all in and boil it? She shrugged. How else? I pulled out some bowls and plates, anything we could use to feed everyone. They were all different sizes, mostly made from wood. Many of them seemed like they'd never been used or hadn't been used in quite some time. I rinsed the usable ones, all the while Charlotte hummed. I like to think I brought a little peace to her that day, and that there was a chance that she'd change her mind someday and return to Vyres with me. But it was too soon to ask her. Still, I relished seeing her that way. Welcome back, Charlotte. Back at my inn that night, I picked up the letter I'd been writing to Young and read over my last sentence. I was relieved to find that she was not the dead-eyed widow I'd abandoned, but a woman of grace and silent strength. What else? How could I describe her? She sang while she cooked and spent long stretches of time in her garden. 
she picked wildflowers and gazed up at the stars. When she speaks of you, she smiles to herself and looks off into the distance, as if she's waiting for her time to come, so that she can be reunited with you in the next life. Through all the loss she suffered, she somehow became more. Ah, and Morgana. Your young daughter, Morgana, glitters with all the charisma and poise of royalty and all the mischievousness that you and I possessed in youth. When Charlotte's gaze fell upon her, I saw in her eyes the glimmer of love that I'd only ever seen when she looked upon you. But something changed today. Today I saw it, when she looked at me. Though Charlotte prefers to remain tied to the simple life she's accustomed to, I will try to win her love. I'll raise Morgana as my own environs. We'll be a family. I was a horrible brother and a liar. Why couldn't I write the truth? I will return to visit your daughter as often as time allows. And if Charlotte permits me, I'll bring her lavish gifts and toys from Vyers. I sighed, disgusted by my lie. I'd rather die than return to Vyers without them. Was this guilt? He'd asked me to take care of her. Ugh, he couldn't have meant this. Come on, Minso, write something true. Though she was born untitled, she'll remain a princess in my eyes. Morgana is true joy embodied, and it seems her most treasured moments are spent telling magical tales. Can you believe it? She has your smile. With all my love, Minso. I'm a fraud. I threw my face into my arms. Ooh, is this for Charlotte? Junho said, pulling the letter from under me. I grabbed for it, but he spun. The smile and dimples dimmed from his face. I clenched my jaw. I hadn't heard him come in. After all this, you plan to leave her? Of course not. His gaze was sharp. Is it because of Suman? Because he's sick? There's nothing you can do to help him. That's not it, I assured him. I felt lucky to have a friend who cared a friend who wanted what was best for me. Then what's this, Minso? He asked, shaking the parchment in the air. I dropped my head. He'd never understand. If the roles were reversed, I'd never forgive him. I didn't need to explain which he I meant. Junho sighed. Have you considered perhaps that he was a better man than you? I laughed, wiping the wet from my eyes. Every day of my life. 26, Lancelot. I spent years searching for Charlotte, and this was the second time I had to walk away without her. Would I die a nameless soldier? My sole purpose had been to become one of Arthur's knights, Rich enough to marry whomever I chose, respected at Arthur's right hand. But what was it all for? Arthur had taken the only thing I'd ever wanted, reduced my life to stolen moments and secrecy. I'd be nothing but his pawn. He was no brother of mine, was he? The bell tower at Wellwood City Center struck noon. They'd be getting married right about now. My face burned. Did he even love her? My mind flashed to the night I'd spent with Gwen, the blush of her cheeks, the clasp of her fingers. I hoped he loved her, because somehow I'd capture Charlotte, I'd become a knight, and whenever his back was turned, I'd have his wife. The problem was Charlotte was untouchable. How was I supposed to capture her when she had ten Viren guards around her at all times? Arthur wouldn't grant me a single one of Camelot's soldiers for this mission. He'd even refused to let Merlin accompany me until she'd begged, and even she'd abandoned me. What was her problem anyway? 
regardless of how she felt about me. I'd never misled her. I was always going to return back to Guinevere. The least she could have done was see the mission through to the end. Years of partnership tossed aside in an instant for a crush. I'd never admit it to her, but I needed her more than ever. Her power, sure. But more than that, I was hurt and alone. Isn't this when friends or family are supposed to step in and lift me? But it had never been that way, had it? No. When I found a way to be knighted and made something of myself, they'd all come, basking in my success, like they'd guided it. I recalled the icy glare Merlin gave me when last I saw her. No, enlisting her help wasn't an option, even if I did swallow my pride enough to apologize. Which left Arthur. I'd have to convince him to allow me some assistance, appeal to the part of him that might still consider us brothers. Yes, I'd ask for his help in order to ultimately betray him, just like he'd done to me after I basically handed him the throne on a silver platter. It had agreeable symmetry. With the haphazard plan in place, I felt reinvigorated. I didn't need foolproof. I needed possible. I spent my trip home in reflection. So much of my time I'd been searching, but I wasn't sure that I'd been looking for Charlotte. I wanted what everyone did. Strength, sense of self, and a place to belong. Had I purposely delayed my return? These lackluster searches and drawn-out training sessions. Did I really need to train to catch some girl? Every path I forged in my mind led me to the same conclusion. I hadn't been before, but now I was ready. Ready to be a knight. Ready to give myself the title. And that was worth more than what Arthur could bestow. I returned to Bullhorn not as a disgraced failure, but as a man ready to embrace my new path. I strode proudly into the castle, let my gaze linger too long on Guinevere in broad daylight, and demanded an audience with Arthur. Based on the number of guards and the caliber of the knights that attended our meeting, Arthur understood how dangerous he'd made me. Knighted with a title, I'd be all the more deadly. But I wasn't there for his life. I was there for his help. He paced. Vias, you say? Yes, sir. Ten of them. I'd need half as many to defeat them. Please, bend your conditions and allow me to... What an interesting opportunity, he said. Perhaps this is the perfect moment to use my ace and expand Camelot's reach. Sir? Jeremy, do you trust me? Not as far as I can throw you. Yes, your majesty. Permit me a few weeks. Stay in Bullhorn and I'll see to it that your next meeting with Charlotte will result in your knighthood. Thank you, sir, I said as I turned to exit. Will you be joining me for dinner? He asked his voice returning to that of a teenage boy. I shook my head. I'm tired. He sighed. Gwen as well. Perhaps Merlin will join me. I turned away before the smile cut into my face. 27. Minso. A knock sounded on my door, and before I could open it, it flew open and Morgana ran in. Minno! She yelled. It had been over a week since a slip of the tongue had given birth to this heinous nickname, and I still wasn't used to it. She leapt onto my bed and jumped herself out of breath. Gabriel peeked in. Hey, man, do you have a minute? Sure, come in, I said. He rubbed his hands together. So Morgana has never spent a single night in this inn, did you know that? His voice was exclamatory. I mirrored it. Is that so? 
And does my little princess want to stay here with me? I reached for her and she jumped into my arms, wrapping her little legs around me, a large heap of her curls bouncing into my mouth and up my nose. I shook them away. Actually, Gabriel said, his voice flattening. I was thinking maybe we could... He shook his head. Trade? I blinked blankly back at him. Morgana and I will take this room, and you can stay in my room. Your room? I gulped. You mean with Charlotte? His eyes dieted to Morgana. It'll be like a game. Game! Morgana shouted. Ah, I said, biting back a smile. And, um, does Charlotte know about this game? Gabriel's eyes shifted. We thought you could surprise her. I exhaled a stomach full of nerves. We, meaning you and Junho. Morgana squealed. And me? I tickled her. And you, of course. I nodded, a calm exterior hiding the hurricane of chaos inside. It was too soon. Things had been going so well. The last few weeks were a dream. Charlotte and I spent every second together that we could, and I could feel it changing. We'd never gotten close again, not like that night by the pond. But we started talking again, the way we used to. The day Charlotte, Morgana, and I spent by the river, she'd laughed so hard she cried. And a few days later, when she dared speak of the past, Her eyes sparkled at the realization that even for a short time, I knew her father, her mother, her friend, the cook, Leon, many council members and mutual acquaintances. I'd known her before all the loss, and suddenly the happy memories she'd shut out with the bad ones were there for us to enjoy together. But I still couldn't bring myself to mention Suman, or my father's order to come home the one I disobeyed with every passing day. Each day with her, I worried that another letter would arrive, a letter informing me of my brother's death. I appreciated what Gabriel and Junho were trying to do, but if they'd given us another month or two, maybe something might happen on its own. But time was against us, both because of Suman's condition and because no one would say it but everyone feared what Lancelot would try next. We were already on borrowed time. We had to return to Vyers while we still could. It just all felt too contrived. Was I just scared? Maybe. But once that line was crossed, there would be no going back. Before I knew it, I'd handed Morgana to Gabriel oblivious of the cheesy smile stuck to his face and mine. Good night, he called. But I was already out the door. I was out of breath when I knocked on Charlotte's door. Had I run there? What was I doing? I wasn't seriously thinking of going through with this, was I? A moment later, the door swung open. Charlotte stood in the doorway, a bright smile on her face. I froze. My brother is sick, I blurted. Suman, my father asked me to come home weeks ago. Her mouth fell open. Oh, you're going then? She said. No, I breathed. I'm not. The thrum of my heart drowned out any attempt at explanation. Her gaze barreled into me and I felt myself grow weaker with every breath she took. She looked behind me. Are Morgana and Gabriel with you? She asked. I shook my head. We traded rooms, I said matter-of-factly. What? She whispered as I eased her back and shut the door behind me. I pulled her body to mine and felt the heave of her chest against me. My body pulsed. And so, she whispered to my lips. My heart slammed against my chest, 
I stared into her eyes and felt her body shake beneath my fingers. I wrapped both my arms around her and held her, hoping her wild heartbeat might calm mine. A hug? What the hell was I doing? Did I just blow that? Was I waiting for her to protest? Yes, of course. She wasn't as foolish as I was. Only one way to know. After this, if I lost her again, I'd die. Shit, I was panicking. She took my face in her hands, her eyes stripping bare each emotion. Fear and doubt burned into ash by adrenaline and desire. Minso, she said, her fingers sending chills down the back of my neck. Fall in love with me. I stepped back, dizzy, the top of my fist over my mouth. Mmm, I moaned. It was as if once again she'd struck me. I took her hand and guided her to her bedroom. I sat on the bed and pulled her onto my lap. I exhaled, my forehead against hers. Damn, Charlotte, please say it again. Her face brightened into a smile. Fall in love. But it was too late. My mouth was on hers, and the line I'd been so hesitant to cross dissolved to nothing. 28. Charlotte. Time blurred as I let myself be devoured by this new feeling. Minso had been right. Loving him was different. Young had been a glowing gold, but Minso was deep, crimson red. Here, where we floated, there were no regrets. There was no fear. Nothing held back. It was the time to surrender. A time to let everything melt away but him. More, I felt my heart beg. Or was it my body? They'd become one and the same, and so had Minso and I. A timid knock sounded at the door, thrusting me back into the world. My dress, I whispered. Where is it? Minso leapt up, searching the room for his things. We dressed in a hurry, and Minso came up behind me to tie my dress. Good, okay, I said, and rushed to the door. Wait, he said. Disoriented, I turned. What? He grabbed and lifted me, pushing me against the wall. He kissed me from my collarbone up my neck to my jaw. I dizzied as he moved to my lips. Why had we even left the bedroom? A knock sounded again at the door, startling us. Minso and I swallowed a laugh, and I quickly adjusted my dress before I pulled the door open. Gabriel and Jun Ho stood at the door, Morgana asleep on Jun Ho's hip. They bit back their smiles as they appraised us. Did you forget about us, Gabriel said. I shook my head. No, of course not. He laughed. It's been two days. What, Minso said. Gabriel said, well, we tried to come back. A few times, Junho added. My face burned scarlet. Gabriel smiled at me. Glad you're alive. Oh, my God. Should we come back? Junho said. Yes, one more day, please. No, come in, I said, stepping aside. As they entered, I felt Minso's hands on my waist. My heart thudded. If I didn't make myself used to him somehow, I'd go mad. I was worried that things with our group would be different since things had changed with Minso and me. But as I watched Gabriel, Junho, and Minso laugh by the fire, Morgana asleep in his lap, I saw something that knocked the breath from my lungs. A family. After all I'd lost and 
everything I was afraid of. Minso had brought the feeling of home back. I looked at the men in my living room, and I knew they'd be around for Morgana's whole life. Families were built with love, and any kind of love would do. Dinner boiled over the fire, and I crept to the door of the living room and listened. And maybe you could show me, Minso said. Jun Ho's voice sounded through the door. Aw. Oh. Gabriel said, from what I can see, you're going to be a great parent. But don't worry, I'll be there the whole time. Jun Ho said he can show me some markets where I can- I heard the sizzle of my pot overflowing behind me. I turned, grabbing my cooking mitt and moving the pot further away from the fire. Vires, I thought. I knew I couldn't keep Minso here any longer. His brother was sick, and it was selfish to keep him. Of course, he'd ask to go. I'd never been as far as Vyers, but if my family would be there, I knew we'd be fine. The next day, Minso, Morgana, and I visited Young's grave. Morgana ran to the tree and turned to Minso. My father died in the war, she said, patting the tree. We come here to visit him. Minso smiled. You know, Morgana, I knew your father. Morgana's eyes widened. You did? Minso took her hand. He was my little brother. Well, she pulled at her hair. What did he look like? I couldn't help but laugh at the question. She'd never asked me that before. He looked just like you, Minso said. Morgana spun, delighted. She beamed. She pointed to the tree. Look at the pretty flowers. I took my usual seat at the base of the tree, listening to their banter. In my kingdom, Vyers, all the trees turn pink this time of year. Don't lie, Morgana said. It's true. Your dad and I used to shake them and pretend the flower petals were snow. Morgana squealed. Minso took a seat beside me, Morgana skipping around the tree. So, I said, say, hypothetically, we went with you to Vyers. What would our lives be like there? He pulled me onto his lap, a confident smirk on his face that reminded me of how he looked when I'd first met him. Well, first, hypothetically, you'd become my wife. He paused, waiting for me to object, but when I didn't, he kissed the top of my head and tightened his grip around me. What about me? Morgana interjected. You'd become a princess. You'd go to school and learn to speak Viren. Teach me now, she demanded. Minso laughed, pulling Morgana onto us both. All right, he said. When we get to Vyers, you can call me Appa. Appa, Appa! Morgana leapt up, her small knees digging into my ribs before she broke away. Appa! She danced. Appa! Each time she spoke the word, Minso smiled so warmly that I'd answered the question before it left my lips. What's that mean? He leaned in, pausing just before his lips touched mine. Father, he said. He kissed me so deeply that I hardly felt the cold band slide onto my finger. He pulled away, his hand still on my chin. Charlotte, will you marry me? Marriage. My heart raced. How had I found myself here again? It was a reckless decision, a scandal, really. Former princess marries fallen husband's brother and regains royal status. I could feel my mother's eyes roll from beyond the grave. I'd never wanted a royal life, and I knew I didn't want that for Morgana. But Minso, I wanted. Was it wrong to want him? 
How quickly I'd forgiven him and allowed him to topple my walls. How cruelly I had pushed aside my guilt or allegiance to Young for the chance to love again. No matter how brutally life passed, I was still the same thoughtless girl I'd always been. Only now, I didn't care. Minso was offering much more than his love. He was offering to become Morgana's father, and with Camelot grabbing allies left and right, Vyers seemed like the safest place on this side of the world. Minso and I could raise Morgana together, and without fear. There I was, trying to convince myself that I was carefully weighing the options, but I wasn't. I was always going to choose Minso. Which is why, when he asked me to marry him, I said yes, without a moment's hesitation. Prince Minso of Vyers, I belong to you now, and you to me. 29. Minso. It was a whirlwind of planning, nerves and bliss that I'd never imagined I was capable of feeling. Appa, Morgana had said. It was the only role that had taken me by surprise more than Charlotte agreeing to become my wife. I kept waiting for the light to leave her eyes, for her to turn away. But she didn't. Winter was over and spring had brought a new life for us. Maybe life wasn't this cruel and meaningless sequence of events, but rather a collection of extraordinary moments. What if everyone lived this way? And extraordinary was, in fact, ordinary. I took a disbelieving breath. Why were moments with Charlotte the only ones that made any sense to me? I'd been lost for so long, convinced myself that Charlotte died with my brother who, even in death, had guided me to be a better man. I would step into the life he left behind and hopefully become a man worthy of it. Appa, I smiled. What a concept, me, a father. Charlotte, Morgana, and I safe and sound in Vyres. My heart beat so fast as the plans came together. We'd leave tomorrow. Gabriel had agreed to come along. He hadn't even required a bit of convincing before he heartily embraced all of it. Me in Morgana's life, a co-parent. Knowing he'd be there too gave me more courage. There was only one moment when I felt guilt slip in. It was when Charlotte said goodbye to her friend Lynn. Charlotte described the encounter with great detail. The excitement in Lynn's eyes to hear of our engagement and the tears in them when Charlotte said her goodbyes. Good friends were hard to come by, and I felt an ache inside me when I thought of taking Charlotte away from that. Still, her and Morgana's safety was paramount. June Ho packed our things at the inn, humming along like he'd orchestrated all the events that led here. Perhaps he did. Maybe he was my guardian angel all this time, or just one hell of a friend. A knock sounded at my door. The apocalypse? Some tragic twist of events? No. Charlotte. My future wife. Charlotte with a gentle smile and mischievous look in her eye that I learned meant she wanted some time alone with me. A look that hammered my chest so hard it could bring me back from the dead. This was my life now. I shut the door behind her. This was my life. This was my life. This was my life. The next morning, the guards finished loading the carriage. Hanbit had given up his seat in the carriage for horseback to allow Morgana and Charlotte to have a seat inside. Morgana pet her favorite two horses, who she named Jelly and Lulu, before stepping up into the carriage. I squeezed Charlotte's hand as the horses pulled through the Wellwood City Gate. We were on our way. This was my life. Almost. A few minutes later, the carriage stopped. No. My heart beat. 
unwelcome as the grim reaper coming to claim my soul, I knew it was over. I had no reason to suspect the delay wasn't a herd of cattle or a wide-framed carriage passing by, except for this was my life, and in my life, happiness was temporary. Stay here, I said to Charlotte, and stepped out of the carriage. At the center of the road were a horse and a man, Lancelot. I drew my sword, but he didn't reach for his, the calm look on his face raising my pulse with each beat of my quaking heart. I have a letter for Mr. Hanbit of Vyres, he said. Shaken, Jae Hyun, his soldiers, Junho, Gabriel, and I turned to the sniveling man who paled so quickly, I might have thought him dead. He stepped forward on shaking legs and Lancelot handed him a letter that I hadn't noticed in his hand until that moment. Silence chipped at my faith as Hanbit's eyes moved across the letter. It has the king's seal, he said, finally. I ran a nervous hand through my hair. Arthur? He shook his head. The king of Vyres. It's from your father. I swallowed hard, the air too thin to sustain me. He turned to the guards. He has asked us to deliver Charlotte to King Arthur as a mandatory term of the Vyres and Camelot Alliance. That's impossible, I said, my voice shaking. There must be some kind of mistake. My father would never agree to a lie with Camelot. There was no way. I knew my father. I trusted him. He'd never sell his kingdom out, let alone to a man like Arthur. I turned to Lancelot. You think we'd fall for such a pathetic trick? Lancelot stepped forward. She won't be harmed. There was nothing but pity in his eyes. Why did he look so certain? It was a lie, and not even a good one. I ripped the letter from Hanbit's hands. There's no doubt, he said. It's written by our king. It's in Viren. It has his seal. It's an order, and we must obey. I stared at it, reading it again and again. It was unmistakably written by my father. My legs weakened as the truth set in. No, I wasn't going to lose her like this. I turned to Jae Hyun. You're not seriously going to obey. He shook his head. I, I'm not sure. He looked at the ground. It's a direct order from our king. He turned to the other guards. It's time to make a choice. One by one, the guards voted. Obey, obey, obey. I shook with disbelief, rage surging through me. Disobey, Jae Hyun said, standing beside me. I walked up to each guard and looked them in the eye one by one. They had been with us this whole time. They'd gotten to know Charlotte. How could they follow an order like this? When they didn't waver, I drew my sword. You'll have to kill a prince of virus first. See if your king welcomes you back. I felt a soft hand on my shoulder and turned to see Charlotte. No, I breathed. Get back in the carriage. I won't let them take you. She touched my face, her voice a gentle whisper in the wind. I need you to take our daughter away from here. Take her to Vyres. Find out what's happening. No, Charlotte. Morgana could be next. Get her away from here. Tears streamed down my face, all my hope draining from my body. I'll find you. Stay alive. I'll find you. I swear. I fell apart, a sobbing wreck as my dream slipped away without so much as a fight. She kissed me softly and stepped back. When she looked back up at me, I saw the light in her eyes had gone out. This was goodbye. 
My nine soldiers walked alongside Charlotte, and Lancelot lifted her and placed her on Lance's horse. Hanbit hesitated a moment, debating which path to take, before he stood beside our carriage. Jaehyun, I said. Go as Charlotte. Make sure nothing happens to her. Yes, sir, he said. Promise me. I promise. He hurried after them, taking his place beside Charlotte. This couldn't be happening. Through sobs, I spoke. You think this makes you a knight, Lancelot? Having your king do everything for you? I gasped. You think you're an honorable man? I drew my sword, desperation flooding my body. I'll fight you right now for her. Lance turned to me somberly. I am not an honorable man, he said. Not anymore. His words seemed meant to wound himself rather than me. Please, I begged, dropping my head. Mommy? Morgana's soft voice sounded from behind me. Fear swelled. She ran to me, peeking at her mother from behind me. I picked her up and carried her back toward the carriage, afraid that Lancelot heard or saw her. I couldn't let her be taken. I'll get her back, I whispered, wiping my wet eyes. I glanced back at Charlotte, her eyes a storm of whispers. Save her. Get out of here. I put Morgana into the carriage, nodding to Gabriel and Junho. Charlotte would have to wait, but my father would pay for this. The whole world would. We were going to Vyers. I had to dethrone a king. 30, Lancelot, a hollow victory. At least he had the decency to make a show of it. You think that makes you a real knight, Lancelot? I wish he hadn't said that. That question revolved in my mind again and again as we began our trip to Bullhorn. It didn't matter how it happened, right? I got the girl. It was a stupid knighthood mission to begin with. Why couldn't I have gotten one like Pansley? Climb the highest peak in Camelot. Or like Owens, win 12 fencing tournaments. No, I had to kidnap some girl, and even so, needed Arthur's help to do it. The gods spoke in Viren, and I couldn't tell if it was to hide their thoughts from Charlotte or from me. Eventually, to drown them out, Charlotte spoke. So you'll be a knight now, she said, casually, her dark curls moving with each gust of the wind or step of the horse. Yeah. I said weakly. What's different from being a regular soldier? Because I hear soldiers in Camelot make three times those of anywhere else. More money, plus the title. So you did all this for a pay raise? In that case, I'll pay you more if you let me go. You're not a queen anymore. I looked at her tattered dress. I doubt you have enough to fill your table. I am to become a princess of Vyres. So Merlin was right. Aren't you advantageous? And I suppose you're doing this for money and a title? For love, she said. She'd spoken it so earnestly that I stopped walking. Me too, I said, involuntarily. Is it that girl Merlin? I saw the way you rushed to save her the night you found us two years ago. I didn't answer. I didn't need some girl poking around in my head. I pulled the reins of the horse forward. You know, she said. Somehow that makes me respect you more. What do you mean? You're a hero in your story, on a quest for the sake of love. Sounds like a hero to me. I turned, only to feel the sharpness of steel cut into my cheek as a flash of red swept by. My cheek stung, and on the ground beside me was a red, dragon-hilted dagger, stuck in the ground. If I'd kept walking, she could have killed me. 
I turned to her, waiting for her to shrink in fear, but she didn't. I'm the hero of my own story. I have my own love to return to. I bound her hags and gagged her. I wouldn't be fooled by her again. I'd consider the dagger a trophy from my quest, but something bothered me. Why use a dagger when she had Merlin's power in her blood? Was she showing mercy? I didn't ask. One of the reasons Arthur had used Viren troops to capture her was to deter her from killing any of Camelot's troops with magic. But this had been smooth. Too smooth. The only possibility I could think of was that Merlin had been wrong. If it was love Charlotte was fighting to get back to, she would have used every ounce of power she possessed. It was unlikely she had any power at all. But I wasn't about to tell Arthur that. Not before he knighted me. Although she'd drawn my blood, something she said quelled my fears. No matter the circumstances of the quest, everything I'd done was for love. And that was a heroic cause. Even Arthur had acquired his position through questionable means. Maybe that's why he'd shown me mercy. But it didn't make him less of a king. It didn't take away from the fact that in five short years, he transformed empty, broken Drethen into thriving, wealthy Camelot. If it weren't for his pursuit of Gwen, I might have been proud of him. Quest or not, I was going home. I'd have Gwen. I was a knight, and I'd earn that title as Arthur earned his. 31. Merlin Fire-wielding was a slow process. It was easy to lose control of the flames, and I'd suffered several minor burns in the process. As soon as the flames flickered red, my chest seized with fear. The basement was an easy place to avoid burning anything important, but it still filled with heat and smoke. When the stones in one room blackened, I'd rotate to the next. I could burn almost two rooms in one day at my current level. I raised my hand, the blue glow cutting through the black smoke like rays of sun through the clouds. I inhaled deeply to muster my energy, only to choke on lungs full of burning stone. I gasped for fresh air, this time crouching below the smoke, but it was no use. Once I started choking, I couldn't recover. I burst through an open door as the smoke was pulled deeper into the cellar by an invisible force. Left, that was the way out. The way toward fresh air, I was certain. But why, then, did the smoke drift right? I followed it through the row of empty rooms, one after another. I hadn't ventured this far. There was no reason to. Each room was exactly the same in size and contents, without exception. However, the staircase I'd come in by was, as far as I knew, the only way down here, too far below the ground for windows. So what was pulling the smoke this way? Further and further I strode, until the last row of lit torches. The darkness stretched out in front of me, pulling the smoke in like hell's gates, summoning a ghostly figure. I swallowed a lump of nervousness I hadn't realized I'd felt, lit a timid blue flame, and entered the dark unknown. The bleak blue light of my flame drenched the corridor in a wintry glow. I resisted the urge to check each cell I passed for anomalies, and instead stayed my course and followed the smoke. A ghostly whistle stopped me in my tracks, and I felt the wisp of cold air run through. It was odd, but what had I to fear? Even drained of most of my power, I could incapacitate any foe I uncovered. But something here was sinister, evil, dangerous. My intuition urged me to turn back. The dark corridor seemed endless, and my growing anxiety spiked as I stepped forward into clean air. I raised my hand, the blue light catching the black smoke as it sucked into one not-so-special cell. The corridor continued on in darkness, but the smoke was my guide. 
I turned into the cell, the back of my mind still curious about how far the corridor went on. I made a mental note to continue exploring until the end. Another day. Each step brought me closer to the eerie whistle. I approached the back wall of the empty room. The smoke hummed as it sucked into a gap between two stones. What was this? Extinguishing my flame, I blinked through the total darkness as I placed my hands flat against the frigid stone. I pushed, and when it didn't budge, I lowered my shoulder and rammed it into the wall. My stomach dropped as the stone door slid forward and the cold whoosh of open air hit my face. I stumbled through, lighting my hand with the shaken panic of a child afraid of the dark. A secret passage? Inside was a room half the size of the cell I'd come from. It was empty except for a black rug that glowed blue in my light. I saw the flicker of the flame mirrored in an object at the center of the rug. There was an archway at the far end of the room that looked like a staircase. Excitement thudded at my chest as I knelt and examined the silvery stone. It looked like a precious metal. Rounded, an oval in shape, but it was too smooth to have come from below the earth. I reached out and rubbed it with my free hand, surprised by its warm surface. What is this? It was the source of the evil that had led me here, and in it, I saw my glowing blue eyes for the first time reflected back at me. I stared in awe of them, my mind brushing over my mother's last word to me. Witch. I tried lifting the stone, but it was heavy and I needed two hands. I wasn't ready to extinguish my light and end my exploration, not when I'd finally found something. Leaving the stone, I walked beneath the archway and held my hand up to see stairs that led upwards. The smoke ascended the staircase, and I followed. My adrenaline pulled me up, flight after flight, but drained me as I huffed breathlessly with no end in view. Determined, I continued. My legs burned, growing heavier with each step up the endless staircase. Finally, I saw a bright green window at the top. Recharged, I climbed the rest of the way, my gaze glued to the glowing square. At the top of the stairs was a large door with an arched window at its center. The opening was covered on the outside by green leafy vines, but I could still hear the whip of the fresh air beyond. I yanked at the handle and pushed at the door, trying to get it open, but it didn't move. Where did this let out? If I'd been brave enough, I would have burned the door down or sliced the hinges with a precise gust of wind, but I wasn't sure where it led or if I'd draw attention to the door. I wanted to get the unusual stone out of here, to examine it in my room where I had natural light. Surely it was worth something, and if it was, it belonged to Arthur. I needed to get it out of here before it was discovered by someone else. I turned and descended the stairs, vowing that I'd inspect every inch of the castle's exterior until I found the door again, from the outside. 32. Minso. When Morgana realized that Charlotte wasn't joining us, she was inconsolable. I held her little body to mine. It was so hot that I feared she'd burst into flame. Her arms were wrapped tightly around me as if she feared letting go, and I ached when I looked at her. Her screams and cries were an echo of how I felt inside. I held her in my arms. It was my fault her mother was taken. Finally, it was more than I could take, and I let myself fall apart once more. My tears drew her attention and she cupped my face in her hands like a concerned parent. When she looked into my eyes, I swear I saw my little brother looking back at me. She took my hand and sat silently beside me as if she understood. I was not her enemy. I wanted Charlotte back too. She wiped my face with her sleeve, 
and we fell back into a weighted silence. She didn't cry again after that, as if she feared I'd cry too. Children cry, overwhelmed by the world around them, certain that adults have the answers. To witness that illusion break must have unsettled her. I wasn't ready to lose Charlotte this way, but neither was Morgana. I couldn't be the man I was when I left Byers. I could not drink Charlotte away this time. I couldn't rely on the crutch of numbness to pull me through. I needed to become the kind of man my brother was, strong enough to pull Morgana out of harm's way and return to Camelot to get Charlotte. Strength was the key to making everything right. I thought of Morgana's hands on my cheeks. She was scared. She needed comfort to know everything would be okay. And instead, she was forced to comfort me at age four. Then it hit me. This was probably how Charlotte felt when Young died. Lost, overwhelmed, scared. It was in a moment of gloom on this level or worse that I had left her in. I took a deep breath and Morgana mimicked me. I smiled. It wasn't for nothing. Despite this pain, I felt more alive than ever. Charlotte brought me back. She trusted me to look after Morgana. I was still alive. I could fix everything. I took Morgana's hands between mine and rubbed them warm. She smiled, but maybe just for me. An hour later, I was relieved that Morgana fell into a deep sleep, her head bouncing with every jerk of the carriage until the coach came to a stop. My first instinct was to panic. Was it Lancelot again? Was he here for Morgana? My nerves eased when Gabriel climbed in, his wide frame jostling the carriage until he rested on the seat. How's she holding up? He asked. She's all right, I said. And you? I looked up at him, his dark eyes scanning my face. I figured as much, he said. But you're not in this alone. I nodded, unable to find my voice. I've never seen Morgana take to anyone so quickly. I sniffed. I'm really happy you agreed to come with us. You've been a great teammate throughout this whole ordeal. I promise, once I know Morgana is safe in Vyars, I'll get Charlotte back. I know. I blanched. What? How? He smiled and leaned back in his seat. Because love always wins. I sighed, disappointed that he didn't have a more concrete answer. Tell that to my brother. And so, he said, biting his lower lip. There's something else. I didn't want to say anything to Charlotte because I wasn't sure. But now I wish I had. I leaned forward, making sure not to wake Morgana. What is it? I don't think Charlotte has what Lancelot and Merlin are looking for. But if she's figured this out, she'll probably pretend she does. What are you saying? I asked. Gabriel eyed Morgana, her breath still steady. Perhaps we should talk about this outside the carriage. 33. Charlotte. I'd never been to Bullhorn. Five years ago, it was tucked safely behind Drethen borders, two armies between their great kingdom and mine. It was all Camelot now, as far as I'd ever traveled. What wasn't Camelot by name was in alliance. Even Vyres had somehow fallen into Arthur's hands. Still, I trusted Minso. He'd sort it out. He'd protect Morgana, and for now it was as far as I could send her away from Arthur's castle. Once again... I'd lost everything I cared about. Morgana, Minso, Gabriel, Junho, 
all for the sake of a title I thought had perished years ago. The Viren soldiers I'd come to know hardly spoke a word to me. They marched me in like the prisoner I was. Was it shame that silenced them? Sadness? Regret? No matter. I felt the isolation seep in with each step we took away from my loved ones. I didn't know what a man like Arthur wanted with me, but I knew from experience it wouldn't be good. As we traveled overnight, I had to stop my mind from cosseting the burgeoning doubt inside. Of course it was over. I'd dared to love again. I'd already learned what the consequences of that were. I thought of tilting my head back, calling out to Young for help as I'd done so many times over the last few years. But he wasn't there. Not out there in the endlessness of space and time, nor inside me. I bit back my urge to cry, and Lancelot reached for his sword. Half out of breath, he glared at me. What did he think I would do? I was outnumbered eleven to one, but the look in his clear green-brown eyes was fear. I recoiled, scrunching my brows together. Based on his mirrored expression, he seemed equally puzzled. After a few dragging moments, he sheathed his sword and we continued. What don't I know? I saw Bullhorn in the distance, a towering city that swallowed the horizon. Trading carts clogged the streets, people rushing in all directions, roads spinning out at every angle like waves from an island. The castle perched above all, from its podium at the center, like a white crown floating above the chaos. Impossible. That kind of growth took hundreds of years. How? How in such a short time did Arthur turn the depleted Drethen Empire into this, the center of humanity? I should have known it was something spectacular, something more tangible than the alliances that rallied so many behind a teenage boy. One thing was certain, Arthur wasn't just anyone. He was born to be a king. The castle was half embedded into the mountain, the white walls only on the half that reached toward the sky. The rest could only be seen up close, with windows carved into the solid rock peeking out at the city below. Attacking Bullhorn Castle would be as useless as attempting to knock down a mountain. It would never fall. And for the first time in five years, I allowed myself to surrender to hopelessness. Lancelot hesitated before helping me off the horse. I stepped down, feeling slightly dizzy and unbalanced from the long journey. Up close, I could feel the immense size of the mountain castle, like being swallowed by the earth. I tore my eyes away and scanned for Arthur. Who was the boy capable of all this? My gaze stopped on a striking girl with green braids. I'd seen her before. She'd saved Morgana from the fire two years ago. Her black eyes were gentle and sympathetic but changed when she turned to Lancelot. Merlin, Lance breathed. Where is Arthur? Merlin spoke, her voice low and beautiful, like the start of a song. He thought it best that I settle the girl in myself. She smirked, lighting up her whole face. I'm actually surprised you made it here in one piece, she said, and her gaze flitted to me. Once again, what did they expect me to do? Merlin turned to the soldiers. You'll dismiss, she said. Jae Hyun stepped forward. With all due respect, I've been ordered to stay with Charlotte. 
Merlin walked up to Jaehyun, his posture stiffening. Did Prince Min So say so? My heart thudded as a silent moment lingered between them. Jaehyun remained frozen. My voice sounded. Please, I said. She turned to me, holding my gaze, before turning back to Jaehyun. She sighed. Fine, we'll accommodate you. She turned to me, her face softening. Charlotte, please come with me. I turned to Lancelot. My dagger, please, I said. Lancelot looked befuddled, but handed me the dagger without so much as a word. I eyed the shallow cut on his cheek as I sheathed it. The dark-fleshed woman turned to Lancelot. Lance, she spat, take care of the others. Take care? I asked as we walked toward the entrance of the Bullhorn Castle. Water and a place to rest until they're ready to return to Vias, she said. I wasn't sure, but from the short interaction between them, it almost seemed like Merlin preferred me to her partner Lancelot. And I wondered where her allegiances lay. 34. Merlin As I led Charlotte into the castle, I felt a sudden overwhelming sense of belonging that I hadn't expected. Since leaving Lance, I'd gone days at a time without speaking to anyone. It dawned on me that I'd never met a person who could understand what this power felt like, what it meant, the way Charlotte could. She was a stranger, but also all I had. What words would she use to describe the sensation? How did her powers differ from my own? I resisted the urge to bombard her immediately with questions and instead felt myself reaching for her energy. I wondered all the while if I'd be able to feel the tingle of that which was beyond the ordinary. I pushed the smallest bit of my own energy to mix with hers. An ordinary person wouldn't notice that I'd done it, They'd feel a wave of lightheadedness or ask for some cold water, but they never suspected I'd had an effect on their energy. But Charlotte wasn't ordinary. She was a witch like me. A future battle mage. A sister. If she felt it, she didn't show it. So I pulled my energy back with a bit of hers, but all I felt was loss and unwavering despair. The guards closed the doors behind us, Charlotte's eyes tallying them as we walked. Impatient, I said, you're not in any danger. Her gaze met mine. It was not unkind, but cold. Why did Vyers ally with Camelot, she asked. What does your king have on them? I pushed a braid behind my ear. The king doesn't share such details with me then who are you to him? My chest warmed. I'm his battle mage. Mage? As in magic? She stepped back. So what they say is true. You're Merlin of Camelot. I paused, waiting for her to connect it all, but her eyes didn't light with understanding. What does he want with me? She asked her curls bouncing around her head like Medusa's coiled snakes. I almost laughed, right there in her face. Was she joking? Did she think I was a fool? It wasn't possible that she didn't know. By the time I was 13, I'd caused enough property damage and sent enough innocent people to the hospital to be burned at the stake. I would have been if not for Arthur. There was only one possibility. Charlotte was lying. I had two options, earn her trust or force it out of her. I preferred the former. There was no reason to make an enemy out of her, but it was possible that Arthur had already done that by bringing her here alone. She was dangerous. With such powerful emotions and a score to settle, she was a threat to the king. 
He was wise to keep her in my charge until we were certain what she could do. We stepped into our shared quarters, her bedroom beside mine. The design was meant for new mothers with young children, the second bedroom a private place for the nurses to care for the babies without being too far away from the mother, but it worked for our purposes as well. Charlotte appeared unimpressed with the castle. Was her sadness masking all other emotions, or was it her royal upbringing that numbed her to such grandeur? I wanted to ask, but I wasn't sure how to word it without insulting her. She hardly spoke another word to me as she compliantly lay on her bed, so I returned to my room. Just as I was about to drift off to sleep, my stomach tightened as the gentle sniffle and muffled breaths of a broken heart sounded on the other side of the door. The next morning, I woke to the dazzling red of a jeweled hilt, the blade an inch above my chest. I'm leaving this castle, Charlotte said. Either you help me, or you die. Why use a dagger? A quick gust of wind sent her flying off the bed, the dagger narrowly missing her leg. She gasped, out of breath. Right, magic. She dropped her head. I have a family, she said. I know you're a good person because you saved us once. My mind flashed to the night I first saw her, the handsome, medium-skinned man and the little Viren baby. Was that who she meant? I eyed her as she pulled herself from the floor and sat down beside me. Why won't you tell me the truth? I asked. What truth? She burst. Frustrated, I leaned closer. That you can do things. She scrunched her brow. You mean magic? I can't. I'm not... I'm not what you think I am, she stammered. Is that why Arthur wants me here? Yes, I pleaded. You're like me. Think about it. When you're scared or worried, things growing, sudden wind or unexplained fire. Her face softened, her eyes widening at the word fire. Her hand rose to her mouth, her chest heaving with understanding. Yes, I whispered. It's fire, isn't it? That night when Lance nearly caught you, you started that fire. She turned away from me as if she worried I'd read her mind. But I'd already seen the truth. She'd conjured fire. She was a witch, like me. She spoke, her voice cracking. Yes, fire. I leapt from the bed, filled with such a surge of excitement I could have turned the bed to dust. I wasn't alone. She shook, but I understood. I too used to fear that confession. But she was safe. I'd show her that she was safe here, that she could trust me. But how? My thoughts brimmed with possibilities. I'd share one of my secrets. I hurried to my closet and pulled out the silvery rock I'd smuggled from the basement cellar. Energy spiraled through me, sending a swirl of unintended wind around me as I carried the strange stone to Charlotte. When she looked up, her eyes were wet. It's okay, Charlotte. You're not alone, I said. Her gaze was fixed on the stone. I thought I could share one of my secrets with you. I shifted my weight nervously. You know, as a show of faith. A soft smile touched the corner of her lips, and she wiped her eyes and stood. What is it? she asked. I don't know, I said. I found it the other day. I held it out for her to touch. She reached for it. A sickly snap, followed by an array of small crunches, sounded from the stone as a crack zigzagged up the side. 35. Charlotte I was not a queen, I was not a princess, and I certainly wasn't a mage. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that my daughter Morgana 
may have become all of those things. Merlin was mistaken. She wanted it to be true. She wanted me to be like her. She wanted not to be alone. She wasn't alone. My daughter understood. My daughter had stories to tell, and while I'd always listened, I'd never understood. Magic and fire, the starring role in all her stories. How had I missed it? Was it because before all of this, there had been no magic in the world? Or had I ignored the signs, desperate for my child to live the ordinary life I craved? I knew they'd go after her. I knew my lie wouldn't hold for long, but maybe I could buy her a little time. I reached out to touch the mirror-like ball, certain it was a royal ornament, but before my fingers could brush the smooth surface, the stone split. My first thought was that Merlin had done something to it with magic, but her face flashed with bewilderment. She yanked back her hands and I instinctively bent and caught it. In an instant, I regretted it. The stone was warm. It moved from the inside, something jabbing at my hands like an irregular heartbeat. The pulse increased, cracking the stone with each thrash. I worried it would slip through my fingers as the weight shifted inside. Through a crevice, I saw a glossy yellow eye. Like a cat's, but twice the size. Paralyzed with fear, I stared down at it. It calmed and poked a pointy green-scaled nose through the crack. It flashed a red, two-pointed tongue and sucked it back before it stretched, breaking the last of the silvery shell, sending pieces crackling to the floor. Talon-ribbed wings outstretched. It peered at me. Merlin gaped. A dragon? The creature climbed out of its shell, perching on my wrist, its body heat warming my chest and face. Its body was lizard-like, but sharp-fanged and nimble. Its scales were soft to the touch, and as shiny as the egg it had hatched from. I froze with fear. Merlin, take it. Take your dragon. The creature's neck shot back, and a soft blue glow emanated from its throat. Merlin, I said, nervous to spook it. It spewed blue flame at my arm, and without hesitation, I yanked my hand back and tossed it into the air. Kill it, I screamed as the creature flew clumsily around the room, knocking into walls and tangling itself in the chandelier. We ducked as it swooped down at us. I grabbed a candlestick. Kill it, Merlin, I screamed. She shook her head. I, uh, I, uh, I don't know what to do. I swatted at it with the candlestick, and it screeched with delight. It's your dragon. Do something. Merlin threw her head back and burst into laughter, clutching her stomach and gasping for air. I swatted mindlessly at the flying lizard before I collapsed on her, and we roared with laughter. Tears streamed down our faces as we struggled to pull our sanity together, ducking at the occasional crash of broken objects around the room that prompted more laughter. <laughs> Control! I sobbed, my cheeks sore from laughing. Control your dragon! I sighed. And this is my life now. You know, nothing surprises me anymore. Speak for yourself, Merlin said, finally able to bring herself to words. I had no idea that was a dragon egg, or that dragons were actually real. So I guess you're opposed to shooting it down? I think it burned my ar I stopped, looking down at my wrist, but instead of blotchy red skin, I found a silvery bracelet clasped tightly around it. 
It was the same smoothness and sheen as the dragon egg had been. What's this, I said, shaking it at Merlin. I tried pulling at it, but it was too tight to slip off my hand. The dragon slammed back into the chandelier with a loud crash. We took cover, Merlin taking my wrist. Her hand lit with an aqua flame that she held to the bracelet. After several seconds, she took my wrist out of the flame and held it to her cheek. Her eyes flicked to me. Still cool. I sighed as the dragon thrashed about, caught in the chandelier. The ceiling creaked, threatening to give out. For God's sake, dragon, just sit down. The green beast calmed, stretched its wings, and glided down. It sat in front of me, the tip of its nose raising and lowering with curiosity. 36. Lancelot. It was the day of the ceremony. My final moments as the street urchin I was. Knighthood meant my family would live among the nobility forever. My bloodline permanently stained blue. There was only one loose end left. Merlin. I hadn't seen her or Charlotte since we arrived in the castle. I knew they must be busy training. But Merlin was now a threat. She knew my secret. That was a kind of secret that got a newly knighted soldier beheaded around here. Of course, Arthur hated getting his hands dirty and much preferred to imprison those who opposed him. But every so often, someone would cross a line and lose their head. This was my moment, and I didn't want to kneel before Arthur and wonder if he would knight me or lop my head off then and there. I took a deep breath outside Merlin's chambers. How would I handle this? Would I try to appeal to her feelings for me? It wasn't a long-term plan. Eventually, she'd realize I was bound only to Guinevere, and she'd have just the leverage to get revenge. I could leverage our friendship, though. Four years on the road together. Sparring partners, drinking companions. A crash sounded from inside of the chamber, and I felt relieved that she was in there. The ceremony was set to begin in an hour, and I was grateful not to have to search for her. I knocked and held my breath until the door swung open, and Merlin's slender body stepped into the frame. Lance, she said, glancing back over her shoulder. I cleared my throat. Can I come in? No she said quickly. The clang of crunching metal blasted from behind her. Charlotte is training. Look, Merlin, we've been friends for a long time. I wanted to know if, well, if you were going to say anything to Arthur about. A heavy thud rattled the chandelier behind her. I tried not to look, but she stepped into my line of sight. So you're still not planning on stopping, she sighed. We're friends, you say? She asked with a smile. And I suppose you want me to protect you. For a split second, my nerves soothed. I love how we're always friends when it's convenient for you. Her bedroom rattled behind her. Guinevere is married to Arthur. I fought my urge to turn away and check the area for listening ears. I say we let it all out at your little ceremony today and we'll just let you get what you deserve. I don't know why you're being like this. Me? I never lied to you. I always told you how I felt about her. Whatever you built up inside your head is on you. And whatever acts of treason you commit are on you. Glad we have that settled. She stepped back and began to shut the door. I stuck my foot between the door and the frame. It stopped, and with one furious push, the door was open. A green mass flew at my face and I ducked. I turned to see a hound-sized lizard scrambling towards me, its wings retracting flat against its back. Is that a- Get out, Lance! 
My heart rammed into my chest as I tried to blink away the illusion in front of me. It couldn't be. With a familiar, unearthly gust of wind, I slid backward out of the chamber. Fine, Merlin said. Your secret from mine. Her eyes blazed blue and a swirl of blue light appeared in her hand. But this doesn't mean we're friends or allies. I don't need to describe the level of hell that will rain down on you if anyone finds out about this. The door slammed shut in my face so hard as my mind raced from one strange phenomenon to the other. Blue eyes. Blue fire? Dragon? When had Merlin unlocked that ability? How did she come to discover such a beast, or get it into the castle unseen? As usual, my meeting with Merlin had led me to more questions than answered. But at least my secret about Gwen was safe for now. An hour later, trumpets sounded as the ceremony commenced. I knelt before Arthur, an equal mix of brotherly admiration and the hatred of a rival swirling inside me. He was still more boy than man. His golden locks peeked out from a crown that slid too far down on his head. He looked like a child in a play. But there wasn't a man or woman in Camelot who would snicker at the expense of their king. The kingdom was dripping with wealth, allies, and trade. And there wasn't a citizen of Camelot who didn't benefit in some way. The extraordinary events surrounding the sword Excalibur might have been looked at as a silly contest for the throne, but was now viewed as divine purpose. And Arthur was the god of this new religion. Each time the story of how he pulled the stone was told, it was stretched into an even holier version. Arthur stood tall, confident that he'd won the hearts of everyone in his kingdom. But why had he chosen to marry Gwen of all people? Was she just the forbidden fruit? Was it a show of power? A test of allegiance? Arthur never did anything without a purpose. I needed to know, but neither a soldier nor a knight could question a king. He looked down at me, and for the first time since I embarked on my quest, I saw the loving brother I'd once known. There was something he wasn't telling me, a reason for marrying Gwen I hadn't guessed at, something Gwen failed to mention. And while a knight couldn't ask a king for his motives, certainly a brother could ask a brother. Arthur raised Excalibur, the golden-hilted broadsword, drawing in the sun's light through the stained glass windows only to reflect it into the eyes of all in attendance. His arm shook as if it would give in from the weight but Arthur didn't lower it. He spoke. By the power vested in me by the divine, through the mighty sword Excalibur, and by all the witnesses here, I dub thee Sir Lancelot. He sheathed Excalibur as the crowd's cheers thundered through the throne room. 37. Minso we moved along the winding roads of Vyres, through the mountain ranges that ran through the land. Organa had been restless ever since we'd gotten off the ship and back into the carriage that waited for us on the other side of the sea. I could tell she'd never traveled so far and longed to stretch her legs. Luckily for me, she was better company than Young or Junho, and had a nearly endless supply of games to entertain and distract us along the way. Even I was surprised when the carriage halted outside the Viren Palace. It was dark, but I wasn't sure how late it actually was. I saw the glow of the red lanterns outside the throne room's flicker. My father was still awake. We stepped outside the carriage, and Morgana gasped at the sight of the castle. She may have seen a castle or two before, but I was certain she'd never seen anything like this. I'd forgotten how lovely it was, until I watched her dance with delight, bowing to each structure as if each was a prince beckoning her out to the dance floor. 
She sang a song with no learnable melody and threw her hands into the air. Her world seemed much more beautiful than mine. But I couldn't stay here and play like I wanted to. I had to fix my world and rescue Vyars from a senile old fool. I turned to Junho. Stay here. You're not going to do anything reckless, are you? He asked. No, I said, but I knew it was a lie. I didn't know if he believed me, but I was visibly shaking, and I hoped he wouldn't notice. I knelt to Morgana. Morgana, see that green tree over there? She nodded. Once a year, that tree turns pink. Why don't you go check it out with Gabriel and Junho while I go say hi to my father? Vyers was just a puppet of Camelot now, sold to the highest bidder by my father. He was a fraud. My mind raced through all he'd taught my brothers and me. Honor, duty, respect, tradition, family, history. What had it all meant to end like this? A few months ago, it wouldn't have mattered. It felt like I had nothing worth protecting, but now I did. I had Morgana. I'd wanted more than anything to raise her in Vyres where I knew she'd be safe. But now the world belonged to Arthur, including Charlotte, the only thing that made any of this worthless throne madness worth it. And my father was to blame. Charlotte, I'm so sorry I left you. I pushed open the double doors of the throne room. My father seated calmly on the throne. Suman was seating to his left, dark circles around his sunken eyes. How did Suman get this sick? Other than him not conceiving a child, what were the signs? Was this illness the cause of my father's decision? I shook away the thought and turned my attention to the king. No, he'd sold his entire kingdom. There was no excuse. My heart beat. Charlotte, I will find you. You bastard! I yelled, drawing my sword. I charged forward. The guards reached for their weapons. Charlotte, we'll be together. I gritted my teeth. You sold fires to that snake? I gasped, tears flowing down my cheeks. Charlotte, we'll be a family. It's your fault he took her, I cried. His face was as emotionless and frozen as a stone sculpture. He sat poised like he'd been waiting for me. You don't deserve to call yourself king. My father stood, waving off the guards. He walked down the stairs that led to the throne and stood in front of me. I'm sorry, Charlotte. I love you. I thought, as if she could feel it. You will die by my hand for selling Vyres. Hundreds of years of history gone. What did he offer you? How much gold does your dignity cost? I raised my sword, my father frozen beneath it. And nothing, nothing will ever come between us. Brother. A voice sounded from beside the throne. Who dare interfere? Suman? No. I turned, struck with paralysis, as Young walked toward me. Mouth agape, I reached my hand out to the phantom. But with bone and flesh, he took it. I dropped my sword, the clang of it jolting me awake. Young. I reached out and wiped his cheek with my thumb the wetness of it still warm. You're alive? I shook, a miraculous moment drug into an endless loop, face to face with my fallen brother. How? He'd been dead for five years. It was impossible. I'd heard him die. Hadn't I? Yet, like a phoenix from the ashes, he stood before me unharmed, years older, as if the dimension he passed through bore the same time rules as this. Was it magic? Was it divine intervention? It's my fault. 
Young said, his voice a sound I feared I'd never hear again. Dazed and overwhelmed, I turned to my father, his emotion cracking through, the hurt of my words no different from what he must have said to himself a thousand times. There in his wounded eyes were all the answers, and at once, I understood. I turned back to Young, the boyish curves of his face straight and pointed, the kindness in his eyes still present. He was an inch taller, his muscles strong and defined as mine had been years ago. His hair was grown out past his ears, his eyes mirroring the awe within me. I clutched his shirt as if any moment he'd slip through my fingers. My father had made a difficult choice, and I judged him too quickly. I should have thrown myself to the kind king's feet and apologized, but I couldn't let go of my brother. With my free arm, I reached for my father and pulled him in for a hug. We all cried a mix of tearful sorrow and laughter. Our kingdom belonged to Arthur now, but he'd traded something more precious than gold. Arthur's hidden currency, love. I wiped my face, but the tears kept falling. Father, I croaked. I would have made that deal, I sobbed. I'm sorry. I meant it, but all hope of avoiding war with Camelot came to an abrupt halt the second the deal was made. Vyers wouldn't go quietly. Suman watched from his seat at the side of the throne. He smiled weakly, an endearing glow I hadn't seen in him in many years. Young lifted his chin, looking me in the eyes. I wondered if I'd ever get used to seeing him like this. We'll get her back, he said. The word her on his lips lit a fire in my chest, leaving me with more questions than answers. Appa? A small voice called drawing the attention of all of us. Morgana trotted past the soldiers, wormed her way between my father, young, and me, and wrapped her arms around my legs. I picked her up. Appa, she said. Why are you crying? I looked up at young, his eyes a tempest, the odd ends of the human emotional spectrum mixing. Dangerous, combustible, but serene. War with Camelot and its allied kingdoms was imminent, and Charlotte was locked away in Arthur's castle. But I felt something far worse was on the horizon. A war for something more precious than a kingdom. Life is cruelly balanced. Young was alive, and in his place, something had to die. It's not until the sun is setting that I remember how brief a time we have. In a matter of moments, the glorious rays of light are swallowed by the horizon, and we're all plunged into darkness once again. You've been listening to Kingdom Soul, book two of the Kingdom Cold series. This book was written by Brittany Chanel and performed by Lessa Lamb and Matthew H. Longoria. If you enjoyed this production, please like and subscribe for more excellent content from these creators and performers. Text copyright 2019 by Brittany Chanel. Audio production copyright 2023 by Brittany Chanel.